G'day, Vampire Lords. Uh, AOS Coach here, and I am joined by the long-term servant of Nagash, uh, Bob Van Emmerich, who recently participated in the Australian Masters, uh, long-time tournament player. You've come to my events, and you're always kicking ass and taking names in, uh, on behalf of Nagash. And we're going to talk about soul black, soul black grave lords let's pronounce things it's been a long day um my voice is messed up from the watch party from old world and um and age of sigma and the purpose of this video you're like oh man why is coach doing another soul black grave lords video well first off people are having a whinge like freaky deaky toys giving me saying that we did a dirty on castellai because i did do a discussion recently with alex gonzalez which was a great discussion but given how big this book is, it's a massive book. And when you go into the unit selection against like the different dynasties, it, it it's a long video. It's a really long video because each of those dynasties plays really differently. So look, the Alex discussion was very much focused around Legion of Blood and uh, Veer Cross. So Bob has taken the charge and the mantle and I've asked him to put a bit of a Legion of Night, put on a, uh, a Castellai, and let's give a little bit of love to the other factions. Not to say that Bob's not going to talk about Legion of Blood. We, I think we both love Nephi, but we're going to put a bit more of a focus so to give you a full holistic battle tome. So that's enough for me. That's my intro. G'day, Bob. Welcome and introduce yourself for anyone who doesn't know who you are. Hey, guys. I'm Bob. Uh, I'm from Newcastle, Australia. And yeah, just been playing Soulblight basically since I started playing Age of Sigma. So I kind of got into it um, maybe like, yeah, in COVID sometime, I was one of the COVID babies, I guess. And uh, when the the Curse City box came out, I loved the minis in it, grabbed it, and I just yeah, went straight into Soul Blight. Um, and yeah, I've been playing it basically the only army I play. So I've, I've got three kids and uh, a job. So it's I find it hard to time. I find it hard to find time to uh, yeah paint more armies and play more armies so your army's incredible it's a lovely painted army you do a great display board and again like again you know for for anyone who doesn't know what the masters is it's a invitational tournament in australia other countries do it the uk a whole bunch of others have these like best of the best type tournaments uh and bob has recently come back competing in the best of the best is oh, this year we did a knockout kind of uh you know to get to the top as opposed to a traditional five game tournament but uh you took you took lead of uh not Le well i keep going to call sob like grave lords legions of nagash because that's mm -hmm. how i first picked up the book yeah and yeah. because it's got legion in it still i just like naturally comes out as legions of nagash and then i catch myself yeah. but yeah. uh you you've been a long time player so i thought you'd be a great way not only from a competitive point of view but mm -hmm. to give us a bit more of a perspective on this particular book what's changed what do you like and between alex and bob the listeners should get a really good understanding of how people at a competitive level are thinking about this book very early on, given we are before any FAQs, we're in the middle of a general's handbook, things will change, but these are just early thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, it was a, it's a very deep book and it's like a list builder's dream. Like that's uh, one thing I find about it. I love, um, just theory crafting a whole heap of lists and going through all all possibilities. Yeah, like Legion Blood's looking pretty strong at the moment and Vehicos as well in its own way. But um, yeah, like uh, you can see some competitive builds in in most of the most of the things. So in most of the sub factions. So yeah, I love it. It's the the list builder's dream, but it's also the list builder's curse because if I'm picking this book up for the first time, mm -hmm. it, it's it's it reminds me a lot like cities, and I'm pretty sure I said this in the last video. You know, you go down these rabbit holes, and you know, you start building a list around, let's say, zombies. Right? I pick zombies, I pick a corpse card, I pick a necromancer because I'm starting to see the synergies. Then I look for other things that lead me down the path. You know, Gorslav, 
But then I'm like, okay, right. I now I need, I don't know, some hard hitting troops, like something elite or something fast. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know, I pick something else. And then I go down this rabbit hole and I go, oh, maybe the zombies are not the right thing. Maybe I go black, uh, black knights or I go blood knights. And you just get into this, like, you, there's a point where you've got to stop. So yeah. this is kind of why I want to talk to you to say, well, mm -hmm. give me another perspective because everyone's talking skellies. Everyone's yeah. talking Nephi. Everyone's talking about certain builds. But mm -hmm. what's the other stuff that's going on? Yeah, exactly. Like that's one thing with this new book where it even it tightened down a little bit even more on the um, like the restrictions in sub factions, and you kind of have to quite you lean into the sub faction and quite a bit more. And um, uh, especially with certain characters and name characters, they've quite sub faction locked now. So it, that in that sense, it has like restricted list, list building a little bit, which was, you know, my initial kind of uh, gripe, I could say, with the book, with the new book. But you know, you just work with what you got, and you'll you'll get there. You'll find the list, and you'll find a way of doing things that will work for you. So get the reps in, and then you get better. So. Yeah, it's especially in Age of Sigma, the game is not always about the list. It's it's about the micro decisions you make in the game. I will mm -hmm. say as well that when I picked up Legions of Nagash for the first time, the very first book, my biggest gripe was that um, I could take the same archetype of a list and put it into all the different sub factions. And it was very much the same. Like it was minor tweaks, but now there very much is very specific clear lanes where things mm -hmm. do really good jobs and it yeah. rewards you for certain builds yeah exactly yeah so so talk to me about you've you've uh, and you you did take soul black grave lords to the masters it was the mm -hmm. old soul black grave lords so this is yeah. pretty fresh for you what yeah. did you notice and like what was your first um what was your first thoughts around the new soul black grave lords battle tome yeah, it was it was funny. It came at a funny time because I was I had Masters and Masters was just after the release and I, I couldn't look at it too much because I knew I was going to be on the old book. So, but I couldn't help myself. I kind of had a look. I, I left all the major list building and theory crafting till Masters was done and the um, drive home from Queensland, eight hour drive or so was is kind of, we're all going over lists and, and stuff like that, which is great. But um. So yeah, initial thoughts on the book, uh, like it's looking strong, just general tidy up, uh, which is good. And going from the old book where I had a lot of CP, um, like management, resource management there, I had lots of um, different command abilities um, that, you know, I had to work out where to use throughout the battle. Like that's kind of not a problem anymore, which is a great um, improvement in my eyes. So um and yeah just just general tidy up basically yeah so not lots of quality of life changes i'd say what do you yeah. mean by that like what do you mean that the quality of life has changed and it's great that uh to answer a little bit of your question it's mm -hmm. great that the book didn't change a lot it's not like nurgle where nurgle fundamentally changed you've mentioned tweaking you've mentioned refinement but what do you mean by what you just said? Uh, so like, just for instance, like the, it's kind of going to that third edition battle tome where monsters um, are all a little bit improved, a little bit more rend, a little bit more um, like less bracketing and that kind of thing. Um, some, you know, some changes like that. Um, basically, yeah, the, the the big change in command ability is going to straight up just abilities on War Scroll helps a lot with uh with that CP management. Um, the less uh, allegiance abilities and like sub faction abilities as well, kind of it, it's leaning towards more that and then just more improvements on War Scrolls, which I find good. Yeah. Yeah. Th th there's there's definitely. Um... And obviously there has been some losers too, right? You didn't get a glow up everywhere across the board. I'll 
clearly zombies oh, as yeah. the first one. That's the one that hurt a lot of people. They're like, oh, I want those zombies to have the six inch pile in and the mortal wounds and like, and I, I don't, I want to pay nothing for them. And mm-hmm. yeah, like, but. But I've seen lists as well where people have gone heavy on zombies. They've gone 100, 120, 140 zombies mm-hmm. recently and just do an industrial amount of mortal wounds. So when, yeah. we, when we talk here, when we talk here, by the way, um, before rudely cutting Bob off, we're talking here from a competitive point of view. Yeah. Um, Bob's probably going to bring in a lot more thoughts around if you wanted to try to go 5-0 and o or 4-1 and one at your next GT, there might be a bit more like cutting of the fat. But I think when I look across the board, if I wanted to go to a tournament and hopefully go 3-2, there's probably a hundred different types of builds if I wanted to just win more than I lose, that there is some good quality stuff to push it to the next level. Yeah. Do you agree or disagree with that? Oh, I agree 100%. And as for things changing, like there's been some improvements, there's been some misses, like you said. Um but there's been some changes which people weren't happy about, but they're more of like a sideways ch- change not, rather than a, a, an all-out nerf in, in a lot of uh, instances. And if you just adjust to those changes, you'll find the um, the strength in the War Scrolls as well, I reckon. Um, you know, and you if you're getting a new Battle Tome, you not, don't exactly want um, the same Battle Tome, do you? You want, you want something new, something new to play with. There's always a bit of an adjustment period, but um, yeah, uh, if and it wasn't cool... new, you know, it wouldn't be that good either. And the cool thing, I guess, as well, is that you're not OBR and you're not corn, where there's yep. a fundamental, very clear thing that needs to be nerfed, you know? Yeah. So it's not like your favorite thing's about to get nerfed to the sun, murder lust, uh, yeah. <laughs> Immortus Guard, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Squigs, yeah. That, yeah, exactly. that like this, there is some still really good stuff in this book. Yeah. Yeah competitively has the book improved like overall do you think um you've improved you've gone backwards or you're around the same level as you were in the last book i'd say competitively the books improved yeah slightly oh yeah i'd say it's improved definitely yeah if i was picking this up for the first time um how how would you describe this this army um, is it a elite army? Is it a horde army? Is it a shooting army? Like what's the, what are the characteristic to you for Soulblight Grave Gravelords? Uh, again, it's because it's such a deep book. You've got a varying amount of builds. Like there's, you can build horde armies. You can go full horde heavy and just have bodies and bodies like for days and then res them and res them and res them. You can have elite hard hitting, like, monster heroes you can go hero hammer that's how i like to play i like to play generally like uh hero hammer mixed arms force and make things too complicated for myself sometimes but um yeah you can go elite kind of uh cav heavy you know there's there's lots of builds so um yeah yeah, again a deep book with just so many varying units it's like i guess it's one of the biggest rosters out of all the age of sigma uh armies i'd say like close to you know bar cities and what um, stormcast. Stormcast. It'd, be t- it'd be top five it'd be top yeah. five when you think about like slaves the darkness and the coalition options yes. it's definitely yeah. top five it's definitely top five yeah at least for death anyway yeah oh it's number one for death and yeah like it, it'll out choice it probably has more war scrolls in here than the entire destruction book to be honest like the yeah. four destruction armies you've yeah. probably got more options in this one book yeah, exactly. So how do you make sense of all of the crazy war scrolls? Because you mentioned the excitement that is list building, but at the same time, it can be analysis paralysis. I want to run the Vangorian Lord and mm. Luke of I, then I've got this unit and this unit. Like there's so many good choices. Yeah. Um, not when I say good, I don't I clearly don't mean like broken. I just mean they stand out choices that I want to yeah. run. How uh, on look- earth do you make sense of it all? Um, like I said before, with the sub faction being quite locked, you're probably starting there, and you're going. I go with the allegiance, uh, like the sub allegiance uh, abilities, and go from there basically, and and see what what fits down that that path. Um, you know, the if you're not utilizing those sub sub faction abilities and kind of 
going towards those kinds of builds, um, then you're not really getting the full potential out of your list, I'd say. So I'd yeah. start there. Um, and then, yeah, it's a matter of uh, going, again, with what your play style is, I guess. You, you could go heavy bodies and 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 the, a lot of the um, sub-factions will lean towards a certain play styles, but you can um like you can mix into a, a different like uh builds into those sub factions if you want yeah like it's not saying i can't run i don't know zombies in a vehicle a veer cross i'm not a veer cross a castellai army like castellai yeah. is clearly rewarding you for vampires but it doesn't mean i've got to go all in and we'll talk about these exactly. sub factions the cursed bloodlines uh very soon mm -hmm. but i wanted to get like your thoughts around just the initial what you take What's good? Like, is there anything in particular that kind of stood out to you? Like, wait, wait a second, I'm going to start building around this in the current season. Yeah, I, I think with the sub factions, like pretty much all the main name character, if you're going with that sub faction, you take that main char name character. It's they're just all really good and all really fit well into their sub faction. Um, Nephi and Legion of Blood. Manfred in Legion of Night, like if you're not um, starting there, like you, you don't have to put them in, like they're not absolute order includes, but in my opinion, I would be putting them in, that's for sure. Yeah, so yeah. start with that. You want your heroes because your heroes are good buff pieces and turn your, um, you know, your cheap kind of bodies or other pieces into like just better, like they better versions of themselves. And and then you know, go from there. You know, you might want some chaff. You might want some heavy hitting units. You know, and just key into what they're going to be doing for you through your allegiance abilities or your sub faction uh, sub faction abilities, and and go from there. I love that I asked you. Like, it, it's hard because when you when you look at it at a sub faction level. So if I look at it at a legion of blood. For example, my favorite units are very different to my favorite units in a Veer Cross army. And mm -hmm. then, like, I, I know what caught a few people off guard in the comment section before was that Veer Cross, for example, I can take enhancements on unique heroes, yeah. which caught people off guard. They're like, wait a second, you got this wrong. Actually, no. Um, so there's a lot of cool customization and different things you can possibly yeah. do. Do you have any favorite uh, units that kind of stood out for you in this book or um, things that maybe you didn't run before that you're now thinking, oh, I want to put this into a list? Um, yeah, definitely. So obviously Neferata, man, she's, I was playing Legion of Blood uh, and took Legion of Blood to Masters for this, uh, the uh, GHB recently. I just lent into the legion of blood i started with fear cost like i said i started with curse city which had a lot of vehicle cost kind of eccentric character uh centric characters but um uh yeah so but oh what else um yeah basically I'll, 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 I'll start you off like i yeah. love the black knights i love black knights yeah. and the white king on steed like that little combination is like i've been waiting a long time for black knights to be good again yeah, and i feel like great. now it's their time in the sun yeah black knights that um combo with the white um white king on steed is just it's that is absolute nails like it's so good um the what are, what else was going to say the vlozda man the vlozda has just had a nice little glow up and is useful in quite a few different uh, of the sub factions so it's good to have a heavy hitting monster and and um do some somewhat reliable damage yeah i'd say I think the cool thing, by the way, for anyone who doesn't know the street lingo, that's Vampire Lord on Zombie oh, yes. Dragon. Yeah. But, um, but I think one thing like to maybe counter what you just said yeah. is that um, I love that the Vangorian Lord is now a viable option where you used to get that little feral thing that happened in the hero phase where it would go crazy and like, you know, you can run and charge, but you couldn't do certain things. Yeah. Now it's actually a viable option, even outside of Avangori. So no longer is the Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon the auto-include, like, 
Killy Hero, you've got actually now a couple of options. Yeah, so that's one weird sideways improvement that um, has happened there. Like, he didn't get the full, like, her, him and Lorca Vi didn't get the full increase of wounds and, and stuff, but it definitely became less swingy, more reliable damage, um, which was good. He did get some change in his abilities. Like you said, he wouldn't, he doesn't go crazy anymore, which sometimes could be handy in, uh, in, in his old War Scroll uh, when I did used to run him. But um, it's funny how he's become a little bit more focused with his spell and has an ability um, to pair him with a, another monster. So, mm. yeah. So if you, you don't, not saying you have to run him with a monster to make him viable in this book, but um, yeah, definitely an overall improvement, I'd say. Yeah, and there's been a heap of bunch of new units as well. And mm -hmm. when we get to the Allegiance stuff, I think we'll kind of unsurf uh, surface a lot more of this stuff. It's obviously very hard to pick favorite units and favorite combinations oh, yeah. at a unit level alone. And look, exactly. I, th I think the thing that I've learned through my experience is if you've got a favorite unit, like you've got this idea, like I just want to run Graveguard. Cool. Mm -hmm. Find a sub-faction that matches your Graveguard. Alternatively, yep. find the sub-faction and then find the units that kind of build into that nicely. So however you want to start, yep. that's how you tackle a book like this because otherwise you'll be, you'll be going down rabbit holes for days. Yeah, exactly. You can start either way, you said. And and sometimes certain units actually um, work with all the sub-factions, you know. It's more limited, the, uh, like the name characters with their sub-faction locked uh, keyword is is where you're more limited to which sub-faction you go. And if you're one of those your favourites, then you probably lean down one of those sub-factions. But most of the base units and, and generic units will, will fit well. I find their place in most of the sub-factions. Before I get into the rules, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about a big change. And I think it's a, a massive change, actually. And that is the hunger. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't think Alex and I talked about it in the in depth that I think it deserves mm -hmm. um, because on paper, like a bunch of your heroes, like Manfred, Nephi, they used to heal a couple of wounds. whoop de doo mm -hmm. Back yep. in the day, there was chalices once per battle that you could drink. Yep. Now all of your vampires can heal like up to six wounds, which is bonkers. Um, what, what was your thoughts when you noticed either units gaining the hunger uh, certain sub factions being able to give the hunger to other things mm -hmm. or just the improvement to the hunger being able to heal more wounds yeah so well, that's one reason i did like nephi in the old book because she did have a d6 heal which was great that could be clutch sometimes but overall i find it it's a a good improvement the only thing is the slight change in when it happens uh which is can be good and also you know, you might miss out on a heal because you get the first attack in when you're fully healed and then you take some damage back and you, you miss out on it. But overall, I think it's an improvement and it might be just a matter of um, order of activation to try and get the most out of it, I'd say. Trying to yeah. trying to work that out and just adjust to that slight change in in when the ability happens, basically. But, but ha like, I think you're going to find most of the heroes and, and vampire units will be a bit more survival now with the amount they're going to be healing. Because, like, was it Felbats and Vargeist? And, yeah. Uh, yep. Like, like you know, the Crimson Court who also gained extra wounds. There was, like, it was more than just, like, your heroes. There's yeah. just so many vampires. Like, those, um, the blood Bloodborne, what are the little vampires that are, like, yeah, jumping Vigos around? Yeah, Bloodborne, like, yeah. Like there's so many units that have that that um that hunger rule, so um, yep. which kind of takes a little bit off your endless legion heal. Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. Um, I found like just in the game they had the other day with legion, uh, the legion knight, I ran a unit of fell bats, and it was definitely helpful. So heaps more, like even though they're you know a little small chaff unit with six up save, they were a lot more survival than they would be without it makes them a bit more of a pain in the backside than oh, yeah. they would without it. But yep. all right. All right, Bob, I'm going to get your thoughts and opinions at a, as a competitive um, focus. So again, uh, Alex and I talked about this, so I'm going to put a bit more responsibility on you. So 
when when you look at endless legion so i guess there's a couple of things right um mm -hmm. we've gained the summonable hero gets um a benefit so previously summonable heroes were never a part of the endless legions which is going to help like your white king uh your mm -hmm. white king on steed the uh, kritza and the, the king king, king yeah king yeah all all summonable heroes so that's a yep. really cool ability ability and yeah. then the endless legion has changed from when you when you heal up or bring back units from previously in the battle shock phase to now in your movement phase hero phase yeah end of uh, movement phase movement phase yeah as a competitive player how do you see this rule do you build around it like what does this mean to you and 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 what advice do you give to me at like an endless legion's point of view yeah it's hard not to build a list without some summonable units now because of this um it's just it was uh it was always hard in the in the last book as well you know you wanted something it's to miss out on that kind of ability to bring things back and that recursion and and to bring them back around the board to take objectives or stop battle tactics like you'd be missing out on some just a core core part of the book basically so for anyone who doesn't know there's uh at, you know when your units are destroyed on a four plus you can bring them back at half strength mm -hmm. uh is it you yep i was just yeah sorry no no i was just gonna say so things like your zombies your skeletons your yep. dire wolves they're all summonable type troops that not limit that not limited to those but they're just examples Yep. Do you build lots of summonables in your list? Do you use all your reinforcement points to make a block of 60 zombies to bring back 30? How do you look at the, those rules? Well, I think there's a sweet spot uh, for certain builds. Uh, again, if you're not going so elite and you're taking some um, a lot of summonable units, you want a, a good amount because if you make – things all reinforced or too reinforced are they really going to die in that uh during that game and you're going to get the wounds back when half the wounds back when you are when you make the roll or if you go a lot of msu you might um get them back quite often but then you go to the point where you have too much msu and you're still gonna um i think there's a sweet spot where you might have some reinforced units some msus that you can go off to snag objectives or die quickly so you can start bringing things back and then the survive more bigger reinforced blocks that uh will survive for longer might die and come back later in the game so that's kind of what i feel about it what yeah. what would be a good example of a unit that you might want to reinforce or maybe situations where you'd want to reinforce them um i guess yeah you could either make thing, certain things uh, a better anvil or a better hammer. So, like, make things last a bit longer. I say a 60 block of zombies is going to uh, is gonna last quite a bit of time on the board with all the recursion that they have uh, in their war scroll and from the, um, the Deathly Invocation. So, um, and what, we, what was the other question about, like, when you would go msu so like, okay so like for example right so yeah. um let's say i've got a unit of skeletons okay mm -hmm. um i love skeletons so i want to start with skellies yeah do you think i would be better off for example running so by the way msu being minimum size unit so do i run 10 skeletons do i spend my reinforcement points to get 20 or 30 um like is there any advice you would give me on how i look at building out like you know do i run 20 zombies and not worry about reinforcement points um yeah that's a good question so when i look at it with my list building i think of what do i need do i need some screens that are just bare minimum numbers that can die it doesn't matter if they die and and then they can come back and serve me later or am i looking for something a bit more survivable or am I looking to reinforce it to get more damage out of it? That, those are the questions you ask. And um, always look at a bit of a healthy balance of bit of bit of um, smaller, like less reinforced units and um, some reinforced units in my list. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I know from I know for myself and my preference, I would run let's say a minimum size unit of direwolves because yep. I can go cap objectives, be yep. annoying, uh, run into shooting units, and soak yep. up the unleash hell, yeah, and exactly. then bring them back at half strength. While yep. my skeletons, I'd want to reinforce because they can also regenerate at the start of combat. Um, zombies, for example, you can you know reinforce them and get a lot of bodies. Yep. It's obviously not to say that you you can't run a minimum size unit of skeletons, but oh no, there's obviously thinking about pros and cons and how you yep. how you want might want to tap into endless legions. Yeah, exactly. Like um, a twenty block of skellies, like a ten block will serve their purpose they can sit on an objective they can screen out a good good amount like you can you can still have these smaller block of skellies but if you it all depends on what you're using that um unit for as to whether you reinforce it or not so what they're doing in your list really consider that um when you're putting it in what is this uh unit going to do for me is it going to be my anvil is it going to be sitting on an objective um a 20 block, a 30 block will probably sit on most objectives without, you know, the um, your opponent putting a lot into it um, and taking out in one go will stay on an objective and give you points um, quite effectively throughout the game, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, I dig yeah. it. Whereas, yeah. whereas cool. if you're looking at screens, you might consider faster units or things to soak up and unleash hell or something, something they can get into the enemy and do do those things that you want for them to do. What I was what I was looking at a little bit earlier that I just wanted to quickly reference because I remember there being a plus one. I couldn't see the literal plus on the screen, but it's I've written add it says add one. I was visually yeah. looking for the plus. So yeah. you, you do get to add one to the role if it's your movement phase. Yeah. Um Given that your units come back now in your movement phase, you can't mm -hmm. pile in, you can't charge. How has that changed things for you? Has that changed your strategy? Has it changed the way you play with this on the table? Or is it literally no change? Because a lot of the times you used to bring them back in the battle shock phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's definitely a, it's a, it's a big change. Um, and Initially, it might seem like, you know, you can't uh, just steal an objective with it or something like that at the end of your opponent's battle shock phase and, and just try and deny some um, primary points. Or, or But I think it's got even more power now, the fact that you um, don't, you, like, you can be just more than three rather than nine. It used to be nine away. So you're able to, it's going to be harder for your opponents to actually screen out um, objectives and stuff like that with your uh, placement of graves and how you're going to bring back units and say yeah you can even bring them back as screens at the end of the movement phase um, to stop your opponents charging you so it's it, all in all it's it's a lot more powerful you might bring them back um, at the end of their movement phase on the objective behind them because it's got a smaller range and they have to consider oh, i'm going to Am I going to charge off this objective to kill the thing that I wanted to and lose points? Or am I going to charge back and just kill this little block of five block of skellies and then you can counter charge them up, uh, on the next turn or something like that, you know? So all in all, it's gotten a lot um, more powerful, I'd say. Yeah, and it could be a great disruptor for a battle tactic. It might actually yeah. be a really good reason to take five doggos because when those doggos go to three doggos, those yeah. little oval bases can spread out and, as you said, screen, deny, um, stop a charge into a hero or whatever you're trying yeah. to protect. Yeah, five blocks of five black knights will do that. Um, yeah, and, and that's one of the strengths in this book is um, through this, especially this uh, allegiance ability is um, denying points and battle tactic and stuff through this is, is quite, um, it's going to come up. I wouldn't say it's quite easy, but it's going to come up a lot of lot through the games and you'll, you'll see it happening. So definitely one of our strengths is, is stopping the, the, the opponent scoring points. Yeah. People never learn against death players to not split attacks. 
Yeah. Like it seems like like death is the perfect army that disrupts people and they're like, oh, I'll split my attacks. I should be able to kill this unit. And between deathless minions and just mm. the way death plays, it's like, no, you, you yeah. go in all in and you do overkill because otherwise you won't kill it. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and as for not moving or piling in, it's it's uh, on the sa- it's on the same turn. So, next turn, if you put them in range of uh, able to just like trot up to your um, opponent's units and and then make a charge easy enough, they're going to be there in a good position. Like, or obviously, it's always like game dependent, and you got to work on the fly to to make these decisions like all those micro decisions count but you can really use this to your advantage based on positioning and and um and setting up for the next turn and thinking about the next turn as well as thinking about this turn and scoring at the end of this turn and stuff like that no like perfect example let's say bob you and i are playing you take the so i take the top of the turn so you know for a fact you're going second in this battle round if you can bring up certain units through endless legions, you now know coming up next turn, as long as this unit doesn't die, that mm-hmm. you're going to be able to move. You're going to be able to regenerate. You're going to be able to do things. Um, yep. So there is some predictability. Oh, yeah. Yeah. As uh, I believe the hero comes back with three wounds taken because yes. it's a summonable unit, you can put it in a position where it'll be relatively safe and then next turn you'll heal it back to full through your, yeah. through the deathly invocation something like that speaking of the hero does uh considering you can now bring up summonable heroes because this is a new feature to De- endless legions do your lists already include a summonable hero are you now thinking about adding one um like how do you see that particular change mm. um definitely considering it more yeah f- versus the last book and the last iteration of those some of those heroes that have gained that keyword um yeah they're definitely on my list of um possible choices now i'd say yeah as well as certain other um changes in their their um abilities and such yeah like like the white king on steed now giving that reroll charge and extra like mortal wounds like adding to the role for the mortal wounds of the the black knights certain abilities like that as well as being summonable just make them so much better they also don't lose their um traits as well and artifacts i believe so good for carrying an artifact and having that annoying survivability of coming back and and having that artifact still say certain things like the amulet amulet of screens you can bring it up in a certain spot where through a grave site and have it perfectly positioned where it's going to be impacting the army um, and then come back if it dies as well and still have it. So so what I'm hearing is that Endless Legion alone is not a reason to take a summonable hero. So it's not like I'm going to take a White King on foot because of Endless Legion, but in addition to all the other things it brings to the army, the value is there, but you're not taking it just for the sake of taking it. Exactly, yep. Fit it into your army. Make sure it uh, it's it's not just just a hero that can be brought back. Make sure it's doing something for the points you spend on it. Yeah, yeah. Because every point, especially in this army, it matters because um, there's a lot of things you want to do, and there's a lot of support pieces you want in your army. So you don't want to spend it like just recklessly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's what I find with this army is that yeah, there's. There's a lot of support pieces, a lot of um, good heroes. Sometimes it's f- hard to find the points on all of them, you know, and you got to make sure that your, your money is well spent. Let, let me transition to something that kind of segues from that nicely, and that's the change to Deathless Minions, which is instead of it being reliant on a hero, so previously you used to have the, a buff on a hero, now just every uh, unit in Soul Black Grave Lords gets a six-up ward. Has that changed much for you? Are you now pairing back the amount of support heroes that you used to have for your units, or does that no. change? It's, like it's just like a little nice glow up. Yeah, again, one of those nice quality of life things that I, I kind of was alluding to at the start. There, it's just it's it's helpful. It hasn't really impacted my list building at all. Uh, I still am bringing because all the support pieces are generally bringing like more than just that, um, but helpful for that 
pack of five blood knights that you go send out on the flank to, you know, um, take an objective and, or to take it out a unit or whatever. Like it's 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 helpful for those moments, but not all, overall like a big impact to your game. So. No, I, I guess as you're, you've got attrition as well, and you know if you happen to get the your heroes dead, it means you're still going to have deathless. So it's a exactly. nice addition, but yeah. it's not it's not game changing. And that does happen. So you know you play a good player, they might you know start picking off your heroes. Back in the old book, it was a bit more impactful then. Yeah, I guess. So definitely a, a quality of life improvement. Yeah, like for example, like I used to play a lot of players with like uh, a lot of zombies and there'd always be a necromancer with Van Hales and I always wanted to get rid of Van Hales. So I sniped that necromancer as best as possible. Uh, and now all of a sudden, not only have you lost Van Hales and you've lost a wizard, but you've also now lost your deathless or you need another hero to go support getting the deathless on the zombies. So it's mm -hmm. more of a flow on effect. Yep, definitely. Yeah, and uh, I believe it before it was from a gravesite as well. So you could get a reasonably good spread and and work around it a bit. But yeah, like with the heroes starting to get picked off and stuff like that, this is just now that that guarantee that you're still getting it, which is nice. Yeah, it's, it is really nice. Speaking of your gravesites, people probably know the rules by now. I don't think the gravesites change, but I would love to know, how do you think about using your gravesites? Are you aggressive in the way that you put your grave sites because you want to bring up summonable units to then like go attack are you defensively and you're thinking about you know bringing back models like because this is this is one of those things like it's a key benefit to your army mm. but how you place it and where you place it it takes a lot of practice and deliberate practice so how do you think about it on an average game obviously mission opponent dependent yeah um like I said, yeah, mission dependent, uh, opponent dependent. You you always have something in your like field. I'd get I I'd say your backfield to make sure you can bring back and protect your home objectives, or or, or you know have something back there that will help um, your army out. But I generally like to place things quite ag like aggressively, maybe so I can if the opponent, you know, trying to. I wouldn't say play mind games, but always put that kind of risk into your opponent's um, in mind that you know it's either in their backfield on their home objective that they or that they might have to screen it off or or just worry about me taking the points back there or have it like t so turn one if they give me the turn it's right on their uh, deployment line so I can bring some things in and have it right in their face. So things like that is how I kind of um, will, you know, what I consider when I'm placing my, uh, yeah, grave sites. I always use, like, my default is like a diamond. So I'll always have one super defensive behind the scenes as, like, worst case scenario. Yeah. One that's always, like you said, aggressive and annoying them and I put the threat of something coming out. And then yeah. two on the flanks is like, a, yeah, I can do things to kind of come in. but Exactly. It, it all depends on where the points are situated. I would, I, I wouldn't place one ever really close to an objective mark, but generally overlapping at least a little bit. So there's always a threat of taking, just summoning them on there without moving, just taking objectives off people. So try and scatter them around so you have a good spread of of that overlap, as well as you know. Um, positioning so you can bring things up and you know ha at any time be a threat of uh, uh to to your opponent like through charges or or whatever through is there strike. any is there any units you like to bring up from the grave uh, is it things like your grave guard and your black yeah. knights those types of things grave guard black knights um definitely those two like you want to keep your grave guard somewhat safe and being a bit you know, being on the slow side with their four inch movement. Um, yeah, you definitely, I definitely keep them in the grave um, to the right moment. Generally, when you are at the bottom of a round is probably the best time to bring them out. So if you fail that nine inch charge, you 
may have the chance of the double and walk him in and and get the um the charge in the next turn. There's always that that risk of um failing the charge, so you got to try and consider that as much as possible. It's not always going to work out. Always situation dependent, and try and adapt to your um opponent and your uh, the game that you're playing at the time. But um something to kind of try and stick to as as best as possible. Is there anything that you can do to like risk mitigate the the failure? Because I've seen so many grave guard come up from the grave, fail the charge, fail the re-roll of the charge. Um, and you only get what plus one from the musician or the banner. So it's not like not you even that. oh even worse. So you know what I yeah, mean? Like so, a... Yeah, so you it's there's no positives like uh pluses to the charge. You just the musician will give you a minimum six inch charge so not gonna help you that's it you need to help you when you come out yeah you need that nine so uh, as far as what i do i generally take bloodthirsty as a, a rule of thumb for my uh, triumph and if i have managed to get it sometimes i might actually depending on if i think it's um warranted i'll you know not make a triumph bid but you know n- not stick in that endless spell for no reason at the end just to fill out my points but blood for thirsty can be quite um quite powerful i guess uh an ability as well as you might deny your opponent a powerful once per game ability through their triumph so but um you know keep that command point spare keep that uh blood thirsty up your sleeve and then again like i said try and put them out on the double so on the uh, before the double in case you get it yeah yeah <laughs> i was looking at the black knights I'm like man they've got the same rule as well that they can charge with a guaranteed six but that still doesn't help i'm i'm so used yeah. to like just looking at the seraphon book where they all get mm-hmm. plus one to their run and charge roll so yeah the white king on steed now gives the um black knights i believe a reroll charge which is good um that's another nice improvement uh through that little combo um but still the regular grave guard i don't believe they have a reroll. no nah, no nah, you'd yeah. have to use a command point exactly um okay so, it, it's good to think about the the grave sites and how you place them and it's obviously a risk so anyway yeah. like you know like do you do you set up cogs probably not it's like you're setting up too many things and mm-hmm. but yeah. the, you know having the, the bloodthirsty um triumph is obviously a good call if there's any other ways that you could find you know getting a plus which is pretty hard but the success rate's pretty low when you think about yeah a nine yeah. charge yeah exactly and that's and so i guess it could be um somewhere where you place the grave guard might be somewhere where your opponent doesn't exactly want to be. So if they get the turn next turn time, they might look at trying to just avoid the grave guard rather than um, just go there and wipe them out. It's it's just the risk that you play, but probably keeping them off the board um, to start off with, with their slow movement, just walking up the board and um, always mission dependent, um, obviously, but it's probably the better what i find is the better um way of dealing with grave garden and how to use them so yeah because you're slow um yep. opponents if you got them on the table and you're running them up the board are just going to try to avoid you like it's a got trek they're just like cool i'm just gonna walk around you exactly. if you've got a lot of shooting it means i'm just gonna pew pew you until you're yep. you know so it's it's a great it's a great way to avoid a lot of that yeah um yeah what about deathly invocation is there anything you'd call at this particular point like obviously you know in your hero phase you can pick three uh summonable units holy within blah 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 blah. you can read the rules but yeah. how does that play into the fact of you know, using summonable units the way you look at your heroes anything you'd yeah. want to call out at this point yeah um just another quality of life improvement with deathly invocation just three wounds straight up three you know um it used to be d3 and a big table of who can do how much and more talk kind of did stuff. four and vampires yeah. did all, three yeah. and like so it was just, just nice clean up and the addition of one number of slain models uh when you're around a grave site it's quite nice as well so for those two wound units like black knights and die wolves you are 
going to either be, you know, healing the one that's on one wound or whatever, or you're going to be um, uh, and bringing one back, I believe, or just bringing back two, which would be great. And, and if you build around this, uh, and, you know, Bob talked about this a little bit earlier, you can really build into this. You're like, cool, I want to bring back these summonable regenerating units. Then you look at the skeletons and you see the skeletons will regenerate in the combat phase. You see yeah. zombies will regenerate after they kill something. So, yeah. you know, that then starts to answer, do I reinforce them or do I keep them as a small unit? And exactly. the story kind of unfolds and you see Veercross and Veercross has some abilities and you kind of start seeing what you're talking about kind of starting to come to life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's Isn't... definitely, um, it's quite nice. And just generally you might have more than say the three, um, summonable units on the board, but m maybe not all of them have taken wounds. Generally about three might be the good, good amount and a good number. I reckon that you'd be bringing back units or healing anyway. So, so there's a few edge cases and, um, uh, other factions that will take, um, you know, do a bit more chip damage throughout your units and stuff. But I feel like that's a good number anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to use as many of my reinforcement points in this army as possible. Mm -hmm. If I can reinforce all the time. <laughs> so there's a lot of ways to customize the force. Um, are there particular spells that you like and you you lean on? I think for me, when I look at this, you've got a quite a strong spell law. Um, things have changed. We've already talked about some of the changes. You used to be able to do two spells on a nine plus. Some of these spells have now just got different abilities on a nine plus. Uh, you used yeah. to have six on either way, uh, either side. Now you're down to three. But are, are there particular spells that you like or first choices? And um, do you have any favorite units to put them on? I think they're all good now. Like, definitely favourite now is probably Spirit Gale. I do miss Amethystine Pinions probably the most out of the old book, but it's just going to three on each side and having them all viable is is a great kind of change, I'd say. Um, there was, in the old book, there was only a few here and there that would probably worth taking, and now they're all all viable, so... There was like two on each side that I always went for, like Decrepify, Amethyst yeah. Pinions, Vile Transference, uh, Fading Vigor. Like they were yep. always my go-to spells. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the the Pinions was nice, the extra six movement to your Vampire. You know, I'm going to miss that. But um, other than that, these are all good changes. Spirit Gal, like, is just has been, like, awesome. Just one wound it. The possibility of two per turn, like, is just chipping away at those kind of support uh, heroes and stuff like that, getting them worried, as well as some other, like, possible chip damage throughout the book you can use as well. Um, like, that can really start to threaten some people's kind of support pieces and, you know, and affect their army from through that as well. So I really like that. Uh, waste away going to like um, not being restricted just heroes with decrepify. I think it was before. Like yeah, that's, yeah, decrepify. That's... Yeah, waste away is what decrepify was, but yeah. decrepify was like heroes only or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that's a nice change, and that's another strength of this army, I guess, is its debuffs there through these spells as well as um, uh, other means throughout the book can really um. Eff like when we're already survival through other means like the um, uh, regeneration and, and that, like this, this makes us even more survival, which is good. Are there any particular units that you like to put on? Like for example, Vile Transference was always on my Vampire Lord on, on Zombie Dragon. Um, now that the hunger has improved, I don't know if I would need that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it would say, I would say that would be on a, bigger hero that you want to make sure is healed up but like you said with the hunger changes it, it's probably it's probably my least used i'd say out of a lot like um yeah when you're looking at when i'm looking at like vampire lore i'm looking at taking spirit gal first and then depending on who the other heroes are what they might be taking vile transference or soul pike so yeah, but 
in terms of the lore of death mages, I'd waste away is probably my go-to now with favorite fading vigor and prison of grief definitely has some um some play with it as well that's for sure making it's just short the, range yeah short range the the i'll get into it with the list later why i've chosen it but um yeah the possibility of it going off 24 is is also quite nice as well yeah that it's it's that that changes the game because when it's at 12 inches it's like eh but yeah. when you can pull off a nine plus to get it 24, that's when it becomes very powerful. Yeah, exactly. But obviously guaranteeing a nine plus chart, a nine plus cast at the time that you need it is, is better of, as an idea than actually like, yeah. It'll, yeah. If nine plus were that easy, your, your grave guard will be charging every time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna we're gonna blitz through these sub factions and spend a little bit more time yeah. with the ones we said we'd spe spend on. But I know yeah. you are a Legion of Blood person, so give me your thoughts on: Do you like it? Is it still strong? Um, do you have any favorites when you look at the Legion of Blood? Yeah, so Legion of Blood, um, the battle traits are really yeah yeah great, quite strong. Just that having them both now, it's and just tidier as well like it was two for the f character and two for the, and one for the yeah, and all that kind of stuff and now just blanket one across the board as well as neferata um being able to have it as well has been mm. a great improvement and yeah it's super strong uh, i really like that um battle trait uh the two heroic actions are going to be um very handy to just have up your sleeve um you know, if you need to take that um little hero off with the four up ward or whatever, just do that um heroic action to take off wards and bam, go kill that hero. It would be really good. Yeah, that's um, delicious. Yeah, yeah. So uh again, it's just gonna be situational. Um you're not gonna be using it every time. Sometimes it'll be better to use the uh the immortal matter just one where you're um you know, you're making command points more expensive, so army dependent and stuff like that as well. I will say, like, before you continue, like, yeah. there's other ways to do this in the game. Like, the first thing I think about is, like, the Nurgle Demon Prince in Slaves of Darkness. And, like, that's cool. It's a great idea. Like, there's artifacts that can do it. Mm -hmm. But when you come up against a unit where you don't need to shut down a ward, you've completely lost an artifact or, you know, Drakford and things like that. But this is a choice. So when you yeah. need it, you've got the heroic action, and it's not a dice roll. There's no there's no failure here. But yeah. when when you don't need it, you've still got heroic recovery, finest hour. Like you've got so yeah. many other great heroic actions that yeah. I just love. Yeah, I really like this kind of um, direction that they've went in with this. I'm not they've done it with a couple of the books, I guess, but um, not every book will get this treatment and it's, it's quite nice it's it's just like tools in that toolbox that you use when you need them you know it's it's quite nice to use on the fly based on all the decisions you have in front of you at the time so what's your favorite command trait uh command trait um yeah do minions <laughs> like the just you know if you're coming up against it's not going to be uh, helpful all the time that's the thing with all the command traits of the legion of blood they are all situational um, based on the army that you're going up against but if you're going up against those you know 20 block of um uh, chaos knights or something that's you know pretty survivable you'll you'll slap doom minions on them and they'll be a lot easier to take down that kind of that that is just yeah it's going to be really good really strong things with minor, natural minus ones to hit all those kinds of things now just two plus they they hit that target so um and the chance to get d3 of them that could be yeah just game changing right there so yeah, especially obviously no hero, no monster, but if you can get like a two or a three and um, the army is built around, you know, a couple of really sort of strong units as opposed to like, you know, thousands of units, yep. that's awesome. 
that yeah, works exactly. really well. Yeah, and they they can be sometimes can be quite um, difficult matchups. I think for Soul Light, that some of those um, uh, armies that are just have those really strong key um, key units. So. What about what about artifacts? Do you have a favorite artifact? I, it surely is Cloak Abyss and Shadows, right? Like that's yeah, <laughs> so I, good. It is, it is, and to have like the Vlosda now with its improvements and um, uh, as well as this on top of it, like yeah, the hunger as well um, being better. Like I went, um, I did a Soul Blight mirror match the other day and went up against uh, a Vlosda with the Cloak of Mist and Shadows on it, and it was, yeah, it was near impossible to take down. So it'll it'll take up so much damage and either yeah. your opponent will ignore it which is probably a bad decision or mm. they're going to put all their concentrated effort and lead the rest of your army like that combination is just so good yeah so that and uh, the amulet of scream is going to be good too i find one of our weaknesses could be a little bit of magic dom um and to have that threat there of you know on a three plus it is you know still on a dice roll and you are getting that character in the general vicinity of that army so it's 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 good but it, it has its little slight limitations you know so yeah. it's a good second artifact but uh yeah. i think first yeah, artifact definitely. is always going to be cloak yeah if you're running the vlosda or a certain piece that you want the cloak of Mr. Shadows on, I would say, yeah, definitely, definitely take it for that kind of thing. I, I don't think it's worth it on a little hero or something like that. You're going to have backline and, and not get in the fight. So, uh, whereas I feel like Amulet of Screams might be um, a bit more like better suited for those kind of characters anyway. Yeah, it might, it, it might not might be too it. bad if you had like a Necromancer and you're building around 60 zombies to give a little bit more protection, but yeah, true true yeah so again the mortal wounds is going to be the um yeah the weakness there so but at least you can pass off those mortals you can pass off wounds yeah. so but yeah, yeah I, I, we both agree like uh, clearly put on a vampire lord on zombie dragon and yeah uh it just slaps yeah let's talk about one of the factions we didn't spend a lot of time on and i know mm -hmm. we did a dirty to manfred um mm -hmm. manfred did change a little bit he okay i'll be actually curious to hear from you about, about manfred specifically because he used to like manfred used to be a great little support hero like he would slap but he wasn't slap as hard as some of the other units his mm -hmm. trick was obviously being able to teleport out of combat instead of fighting and yep. that obviously created a great bunch of tricks but now mm -hmm. you can redeploy you can redeploy there's a whole bunch of cool shenanigans that he, he now can do what are your thoughts on manny and what are your thoughts on the legion of night uh yeah so has some definite strong abilities in legion of night um and manfred keys into it as well with his war scroll changes he's had a, a lot of people were very upset with his um war scroll change and you know i think he's getting nerfed under the sun and all this kind of stuff and um i would you know in certain ways you you could say that but i uh, i feel like it's another one of those sideways um uh, changes versus more of a nerf like he's he's still strong he's gotten uh the slight glow ups in just the less bracketing and and a few more attacks and a bit more ran and a bit more um reliable damage which is great and um yeah, his ability to charge out of phase is uh, yeah, it's pretty going to be pretty strong and and strike first when he charges as well. It's going to be really strong um, uh, to shut down um, armies, especially armies that rely on that kind of uh, their charge abilities and stuff like that. So just before we before we move into the actual sub faction, as an mm -hmm. experienced player. When I read this ability, right, because, like, you could almost go, so what? Like, so in addition, if this unit receives a redeploy command, it can attempt to charge instead of making a D6 move. So uh, a unit finishes within nine. It now allows me to do a redeploy. Mm -hmm. But with Manfred, I can charge instead of redeploy. Yeah. Why is this good? And why is this maybe a sleeper that people aren't talking enough about? 
Well, for certain armies, he's going to like be able to get in there and get the first strike, maybe neuter him a little bit, neuter that uh, unit. He, um, rather than roll the one on the redeploy and still take the hit, um, like we all do, always a one. Um, but yeah, just position him. It'll be, it, it could be used to position him where you want him to be, where you want him to do that strikes first. And again, just shut down certain abilities through that the opponents do through charges like ogres, um, increase rend on to certain things like our blood knights, I think um, chaos knights as well, certain things like that. Um, people that rely on that, um, that that change in their war scroll or that damage that they do through that the, their charges um, that, uh, yeah, will, will, will help a lot. So... I think the other benefit too to call out is uh, especially when a battle tactic calls out specific unit A needs to kill specific unit B. So like um, yes. this one's mine, for example, like I pick my general, my general yep. has to go kill a particular unit. Cool. Manfred is now going to go interrupt that sequence, yep. pin the general down. All of a sudden yep. you can't complete that battle tactic because I've stopped, I've defended that unit yep. or I've, I've, yeah, as you've said, you've interrupted the, the charge. Yeah, same with you. They've tried that. You're on an objective. They want to take that objective. You go, hey, now this um, like fight's going to happen off the objective. You're not going to be able to get it off me. So it's, it's well, going to be good for well, denying points like that as well. Well, you get Manfred on the objective and you've now added five. And because well. when Man, Manfred, Manfred gets the strike first when he charges, so then you might clear a couple more models. So there's a lot of cool things yep. that on paper you might not appreciate. Yeah. And then. So this in combination, I see a bit of a little bit of a combo here with the, the battle trait Aegis Cunning, where you can also make another um, charge. And this one's when the enemy charges within 12 of a unit of yours. So you might charge um, Manny up um, in as a redeploy in their movement phase. And then they go, well, you know, I'm going to now have to charge man through it with other units that were close by and then you bring in uh say the vlozda that's sitting there as well and charge with that in their um uh charge phase as well so you're it's it's about shutting down their charge charge as well yeah in combination with these two heavy hitting heroes that they might not have actually wanted to pull into combat at that at that certain time so then you have two yeah. five um Bodies counting as five on their objective, or or vice versa, you know. So it might be a way to get your uh, those grave guard who failed their charge to get them exactly. into combat. Uh, yep. Bring in those black knights to do mortal wounds on the charge. Like yep. the there's a domino effect of sequence here, which is yep. which is forty uh, zombies coming in, taking that taking that their objective that they thought they had. So yeah, brilliant. Like brilliant. Yeah. So yeah, so and then. Um, I guess, yeah, the swift form as well is another, uh, another, um, thing that might key into this as well. You might move Manfred around to, into a position where you feel like he's going to get that redeploy, uh, action. You might, uh, yeah, those kinds of things. So they, they, yeah, all, by, they by, by the way, I just, I just, I just want to interrupt here because I did this last time I messed up. It's only one. I'm an idiot. Swift form is pick one friendly Legion of Night vampire hero. So ignore the screen. It's one, not two. Yeah. Okay, so no, just, yeah. I, I just, just want to, I'm actually yeah. myself because yeah. I remember talking to Alex and I'm like, why would I do two? Like, it's not mirror dance. Like what is going on here? It's, <laughs> I'm an idiot and yeah. I can't type the letter one. Yeah. No, Number that's one. right fat fingers <laughs> well i mean retyping a whole battle tome like it just, oh, just yeah, give yeah. me a <laughs> bound <laughs> to make a happen. mistake somewhere yeah but exactly. like tell me tell me about swift form right so i can pick one friendly legion of blood vampire hero why is this good uh heroic action um yeah again uh, it might be you might use it defensively you might use it aggressively you might send manfred up into a position where it's going to force that um uh well it's gonna make that potent think oh he's a nice target i might go into him he'll position himself where he's going to get that redeploy move and and go into combat when they're not expecting it or it might be that you they've moved up 
and are threatening a hero and you go, right, I'm going to just get out of this, um, get out of the way and go to somewhere safe and or cap an objective or, you know, that this as well, like, is just going to be another one of those movement things that we have where the opponent probably can't screen out all the objectives and um, stop you from just taking one throughout the game. Maybe this could be used at the end of the, like, round five with just your Vampire Lord that's left. Just go send him on objective and, and take it. So there's going to be lots of situations where this is going to be very helpful. A couple of other ones that I think about, right, is uh, in the current season, I could use it to go desecrate, uh, yep. go go do that battle tactic. If it was a monster vampire, I could go smash to rubble if my opponent has um, faction terrain uh, yep. and I happen to obviously get in. There's a lot of little utility pieces here, get things back into synergy or buff range for certain things. Uh, Definitely. There's, there's a lot of cool things here. I, as a, as a daughter's a cane player who has like the teleport shenanigans, I mm -hmm. love it. Mm -hmm. um, what what type of vampire heroes benefit from this? Like, is this your vampire on zombie dragon, your vampire on foot? Yeah. Like, who, who are you thinking like benefits from this the most? Uh, any, any and all, basically, depending on the situation. Like I said, you could use it on many to do that, um, that combo with his uh, redeploy kind of charge you could just use it on that vampire lord uh i think um in my list i i have the morbeg's claw which i'll go into uh that'll um you could use that heroic action to just keep moving that vampire lord into range just keep popping that morbeg's claw for the bonus to cast you can do things like that you might um like you said like, like um you might use it defensively um say your vampire lord on zombie dragon is sitting there he's got a couple of wounds left he can't take that charge and take impact mortals or you know that one activation of fighting you might want to take him out put him somewhere safe where he can charge in and get that first activation to start getting that hunger back those, those kind of situations it's going to be very very good and situational and you're just going to adapt and use it when uh on whoever whenever it's necessary uh, i will call out that um while it is a vampire in legion of night there's a whole bunch of vampires in the book that are named veer cross right so you're not going to do it on lady annika you're not going yeah. to be able to do it on like chattaka there's a yeah. like belladama so um you're probably looking at what vampire lord vampire lord on zombie dragon yep. uh vengo vengo Ven yeah the vengorian lord obviously not luca um no it's it's locked to and obviously you can bring in luke of I into this army yep. but she's not going to benefit from these rules exactly yeah yeah what what about into the jaws of death like i read that and i'm like this is pretty cool um because normally in my legion of night i would have a vampire lord on zombie dragon so i yep. would be able to benefit from this monstrous rampage yeah so i looked at this and thought uh and this in combination with swift uh, with the Aegis Cunning and charging out of phase, it's kind of like a um, unleash hell that you can do in your opponent's charge phase, and a, another way of shutting down and their this their your opponent's um, charge and their turn per se. You know, it's like their turn to charge. They're going to come in and do the damage. Where all of a sudden, you've charged Manfred in, you've charged your Vlozder in, you've Manfred gets to strike first. Your Vlodster gets to do this kind of unleash hell because generally you've charged into someone that's made a charge, and your Vlodster can can activate this into the jaws of death uh, ability. You know, so yeah, you know, try and pick something that's made a low roll charge, and you might be going into multiple combats. So this this could um yeah could come in good into that kind of combo. This could be brutal because obviously the pestilential breath has changed. It used to be just one attack and it had a high rend. Now it's D6 attacks, three threes, rend one for three damage. Yeah. So if you get bogged up with chaff, for example, I don't know, like just generic chaff, mm -hmm. cheap bodies, um, rend one for damage three could be, and they can't use all that defense at this particular point in the, in the, yeah. in the charge phase. So yep. that damage three could go quite far, even like Stormcast, like they don't like 
they don't like Renoir. Um, yeah. And that's a very costly bodies. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you're not you you have to make the roll over their charge, but you don't you're not getting like the minus one to hit that you do with a, a proper unleash hell. So um it it really um yeah it could be devastating that's for sure cool i i, I like it um yeah. i probably don't like it enough to take a zombie dragon alone although the reserve shenanigans i do love like i'm not gonna lie i love it yeah. but i think it's just better as an idea as opposed to actually putting it on yeah. the table and so the zombie dragon it can be put on the vlozda right because it's zombie dragon keyword yeah so yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry 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 so i'm i'm i'm, yeah. I'm talking about You're... like the reserve yeah. thing from the zombie dragon yeah. but yes this works for both vampire lord and non-vampire yeah. lord zombie dragon yeah yeah I, I i've seen a few people asking that question here and there on the internet and i yeah i believe it would well, work keyword yeah it's exactly. keyworded like it's legion of uh, so, yeah you can also use this in your charge um at the end of your charge phase as well as a uh unleash hell so it could be like a double unleash hell situation um oh yeah no no you're right because unleash hell unleash hell would be a command ability and uh this is a monstrous rampage so yes absolutely yep. you could do this twice so you could be well, doing it could be doing a decent amount of damage whether you think it's worth it at the time you got to make that decision at the time but you know always tools in the toolbox that you got to consider at the time anything i've learned as a legion of night player it's the psychology right it's the i could do it are you sure you want to charge i could unleash hell and then monstrous rampage like are you yeah. sure you want to do this yeah yeah exactly so it is something that someone might go oh that could spike d6 d6 that's a lot that's a lot of attacks going through and a lot of possible damage so uh, again it's just like it's another tech into shutting down um the opponent's charge phase and when they feel they're going to do a lot of work do you have a favorite command trait uh look so all of these i i wouldn't say the the strongest in the book per se but i do like the bait i don't feel i, I think above su suspicion would be good in certain matchups where you feel like you need to keep your general safe per se but again it's uh, um you know relying on that nine inch charge if it's your vlozda and you you're bringing in nine away and you you're not getting any bonuses to charge so uh there's that um i think the bait's strong now that it's got the plus one to ward rolls as well as save rolls um i think that's pretty strong especially when you consider there's quite a few um armies out there that want to alpha you you can set up screens and know that they're gonna not that you don't want your screens to survive uh to die exactly um like but having them a bit more survival round one and to be able to retaliate and keeping them alive a little bit longer and letting them die later is not is not a bad thing yeah, that's not too bad. It's not too bad. Yeah, for me, like the command traits don't stand out. Um, mm. I used to really enjoy in when I go back to my Legion of Night days under Legions of Nagash book, I would use the above suspicion style ability to come uh, come in from reserve. But I also used to have like um, uh, Morgast Harbringers who used to have the three d six charge to support. But that's mm. obviously now an OBR unit, yeah. and like there's not as we've talked about with Graveguard. There's just not a lot of guaranteed ways to get into combat, or at least ways to mitigate the risk. So yeah. you're also missing out on your your uh, magic, like your hero phase with that um, hero, your um, command point, all those yeah. kind of things. So again, it's it's nothing that um, really sticks out to me too much. The unbending will, yes, it's strong, but having the restriction of being uh, wholly around, like or wholly within the 12 inches of the general is it just makes it situational and is it going to be worth it probably not whereas i feel like the bait just is probably the most bang for your buck in out of all three i feel like unbending will is rewarding you from having a defensive general so i i know legion of night i want to be offensive so again vampire lot on zombie dragon going out at my opponent maybe supported mm -hmm. with manfred and maybe some 
Vargeist, maybe some like just some uh, aggressive style. While this wants me to sit back and maybe it's building around the White King, uh, supporting a bunch of skellies because they're going to be grinding and just slowly advancing up the board. Uh, I don't know. That's a kind of like the style for me because your yeah. aggressive generals are going to be too far away yeah. from your summonables. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, if you're building into that, then you'd, yeah, that's probably something to consider there for sure. Maybe like maybe can... if your general was a white king on maybe if your general was a white king on steed and you're building a lot of black knights, given that they're yeah. summonable. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I could see that. And black knights, I guess, are a smaller unit. So yeah, having them count as two would, would be helpful for sure. Yeah. Plus obviously the mortals on the charge will help the attrition yeah. and controlling an objective. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm thinking ideas here. I'm trying to think of like what oh, yeah. where Why? where this might be beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, no, I see that. That's that's a good pickup. What about your yeah. artifacts? Again, uh yeah, not like they're good and definitely uh, useful, not as standout as some artifacts, you know. Cloak of Mist and Shadows, but uh, Mist, yep. Mist and Shadows. But um, no, I, I like Morbeg's Claw, just that plus two to cast. Um, uh, in combination with the ability to move that character with the um, the teleport ability, the Swift Form is it makes it a little, just that little bit more handy, you know. So um, just moving it to where you want it, having that plus two to cast reliability is yeah in a um you know just uh, like there's some strong magic armies out there so yeah two to cast is always always nice it could be helpful and obviously we're in the middle of the current general's handbook but if we go into like a magic meta given that we have seraphon given we have lumineth and zinch and there's a lot of magic -y fight focused armies at the moment if the jet next general's handbook rewards magic that the claw is great, but I, I agree with you. The all three of them don't stand out. No. Um, I'd probably go to something more generic, but of the three, yeah, yeah I, I probably agree with you on claw. I mean, I like the cloak. Uh, if you like, say, on the something with more wounds, the vampire lord on zombie dragon, you're being aggressive with it, it might it's going to take wounds and and heal, you know, like over the course of the battle with it healing and taking wounds and taking um you know being in the fight you might deal a nice amount of wounds back so it's it's it could have its value there yeah. for sure yeah yeah Any, anything else you'd mention on legion of night and by the way folks uh we do have a legion of night list as well as a uh castellai list so mm. we we agreed that this would be the castellai and legion of night focus uh but so more more is going to come in very shortly ish mm. uh nothing no else? yeah nothing really else like the shard of night's nice but Again, it's it's situational. There's mainly, um, you know, mortal wounds shooting is the big threat. So, yeah, but but there is a lot KO. more shooting in the game, like KO, yeah. KO, are cast, strong, which is a real, they do, you know, they have their rend. So, cities, yeah. like there is a lot yeah. of shooting, but yes, mortals is going to be the thing that's going to do damage to you. Yeah. Look, we talked extensively with Alex on Veercross, but I'd love your couple of minute focus on what do you think of veer cross do you like it do you think it has good play like where, where do you think this one stands for you yeah uh so definitely um yeah i started with veer cross and um yeah enjoyed it i like the characters um definitely if you're leaning towards or if you horde heavy is probably your um your your focus or you like building into that then via cost definitely sounds like you're um it could be helpful for you um but with the it's 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 going to be a lot of bubbles and controlling and and flooding the board which is just not my kind of play style really anymore or i, I don't mind a few bubbles and and few synergies and stuff like that but this is just going to be 
a lot of different ones. And with the account, maybe this current general's handbook with um, unique heroes and that still being able to shot be shot and stuff like that. If you're um, building into this uh, the vehicles with lots of named characters and them giving a lot of buffs out and bubbles that you might be susceptible to be getting picked off and and um and and worn down that way and and the way around that is just having lots of board control and bodies and resing and stuff like that but uh, you got to be prepared to push a lot around the board and and just play that down that play style i think to be fair in most generals handbooks just not this last six months that's true right like you know yes. you can't protect your heroes anyway so exactly yeah yeah that's yeah so and next general handbook's probably going to be different so um yeah it's gonna it's gonna be strong though i think i do see the value in some of the stuff that they've got there and it's cool little um uh, thing that you can put um because there are so many name characters um you're gonna um, run some so it's cool to put the command traits and and um artifacts on them but um sorry no no, no. i was just going to quickly call out that um because this seemed to cause a lot of confusion in the last video mm -hmm. so with the command traits and the artifacts you can put them on the unique heroes if specifically in veer cross yeah. um but it doesn't mean that you could put arcane tome or master of magic yeah. because it is specifically calling out the Veer Cross command yep. traits and artifacts on specifically the Veer Cross unique heroes. Unix. Yeah. Yeah. Belladama and the likes. So, and, you know, she's probably an auto pick for this army. She's just for this, uh, yeah, this dynasty. She's, she's got some great abilities and great, um, kind of, she puts a lot of benefits out on this army. So definitely, uh, start with her, I'd say. Radikar yeah, the Beast, not... not not so certain he's he's um as viable as he was now that anyone can summon in ten wolves. I don't know if he it's he's worth the points now that you're paying for him uh, when he doesn't when you're not relying on him as to take uh, to bring those ten wolves in. I'd say um, he's kind of you know he got a bit more rend and a bit and he got the minus one to wound which is great but i don't know if it's it kind of 300 300 ish point yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a little expensive when you look at it but, but then yeah. again yeah it, it's an interesting choice um yeah he still slaps but he, he, he still slaps he's a little expensive he still slaps his bubble uh reduced inside size a bit and he got um and it got keyword locked to just summonable units in vehicles so whereas it used to be all soul blight units within 18 a wholly within 18, 18 which is a massive yeah. bubble and it benefited all your heroes himself and all this kind of these things that made yeah it was a good combo if you were going to build a veer cross army what's your favorite command trait and artifact uh look so i mean if you were running radicar the beast the reroll charges would be nice considering you can run in charge and um he slaps but probably just the the three inch move on dead walkers on uh dead walkers around the general it's probably a good one i'd say mm. um all the artifacts are quite good i'd say um yeah like just the phylactery is the one that stands out for me yeah yeah like the five up ward on you just put that on Bella Dama. She can give her wolves around her that she's passing off wool, wool um, passing off uh, her saves onto. Now I get a five up ward, which is uh, is would be nice and strong. Um, yeah, the they're all pretty good. Like if you, I feel like you could take any of them, and they're all going to be doing work for you. That's for sure. I'm going to ask you a dumb question that I know the answer for already, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Let's say I got Veer Cross and I run Nagash and I take an artifact on a different hero with the phylactery. So Nagash giving me a, a five up ward, then the phylactery, if the synergy bubbles work together, brings it down to a four plus. 
Good Does idea, it. bad idea. Does it bring it to a five up, a four up well, ward? That, that's well, the question. Actually, it, it adds one to the ward rolls for the deathless minions, but his might be a. Oh, the yes. His, yeah, you, his might be specifically uh, his own. Let, let me look up Nagash. Let me look up Nagash. But in, mm. let's assume that I'm true and then we can, I'm actually myself anyway. Is it? Yeah. It, no, it's. If it's it just worked, is it done? Fast. Um, I mean, if it was a four up ward on all year, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it still with Nagash, you know, we'll get into Nagash soon, I think, but, yeah, um, cool. yeah, I don't think it'd be worth it. And I don't think it works. It, it doesn't work. You're right. So I'm yeah. looking at it. The ability is not a five up deathless. It's Mordecai, which is giving deathless a friendly, a, a friendly deathless within 12, a five up ward. So yeah. because this is pointing specifically at the deathless minions, yep. it doesn't stack. So even yeah. if it did work, it's probably dumb. Uh, and we've just clearly worked out quickly that it doesn't even work. So yeah. let's just move along. And it doesn't also work for um, a lot of people who are kind of trying to figure this out at the start. It doesn't also work with um, Torgilius, who also has a five-up ward for summonable vehicles around him as well. That's also a, its own unique kind of ability. But in saying that, you could have now several bubble, bubbles of five-up wards through your army through the likes of all those. So, yeah. I mean, it would make your um, body heavy um, kind of board control horde style play even more survivable. Yeah, five up ward for like 60 zombies is a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the other unit, the other sub faction that uh, I did not give a lot of love about. And um, look, I am not the biggest fan. I was actually having a conversation with Freaky Deaky, that, that little comment on YouTube the, the other day. And I said to him, this is my comment. I said, he's a big Castellai fan and mm -hmm. uh, he loves his Blood Knights, loves Vordry. Uh, he was running in first edition, like five units of Blood Knights. He he loves them, right? Mm -hmm. And when I look at Castellai, it's decent. I just feel like I could almost take the same type of list put it in one of the other sub factions and it's probably better. Uh, I could put this in Legion of blood, for example, I could take the same type of list, put it in Legion of blood and it's better. Am I just being too harsh? Am I missing something? Like where do you, where do you stand with Castellai? Um, look, uh, I feel like you're, yeah, you're being maybe a little bit too harsh, but All right. you got to build into the, I, I would say you got to, you can't forget about your summonable units, but you got to build into that um, possible level up aspect of Castle Eye that could make them quite powerful. So, um, Prince Vordry, obviously, you'd take him in Castle Eye, but you wouldn't take him in Legion of Blood. He wouldn't be gaining no. anything there. So, Let, okay, when I make that comment, I mean, yeah. like, okay, grab, grab Prince Vordry, Neferata, swap them out. But the yep. rest of the list stays the same. Like I just feel like blood is better. So yeah. I've, I've made my stance. Talk to me about Castellai and why you like it and how you might build around it. Yeah, so I, I do probably agree with you that optimally the Legion of Blood list is probably going to be better, but you're still going to find play with Castellai and it's going to have its I good matchups. And Agreed. I agree that have, I agree with that. Yeah, you're gonna have fun with it, and you know the level up aspect of it is is yeah could be quite strong, and you could build up certain units as well as with the ability to um, kind of double up on them in the way uh, through multiple units versus not on the same unit, but like a certain unit gains a um. Uh, uh, one of the bonuses, the um, what are they called? The um, is it, is it the Might of the Crimson Keep? Where... Might of the Crimson Keep ability. Sorry, I forgot the main uh, allegiance ability, a uh, battle trait. Um, yeah, like you can. There's certain abilities throughout. Um, the I think there's a it's a command trait or Prince Vordry can start dishing it out to other people and and make them strong as well. So. 
Yeah, because obviously with the Crimson Keep, um, yeah. you know, at the at the end of the combat phase, if an enemy model was slain by attacks with melee by the Castellai Vampire, so yeah. that's obviously your Vampire Lord and Zombie Dragon, Prince Vordry, your Blood Knights, your Vargeist, like there's a lot of vampire yeah. type units. Yep. You get to pick, pick one of the following, whether it's plus one damage, uh, you get to add uh, plus one attack, you get to add plus one to the to movement, there's a yep. whole bunch of series of buffs that I guess progressively as the game goes on, you get better. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be, which is, it's, it's a cool, um, uh, it's just a cool fun mechanic that um, if you'd like to play into it, uh, you could definitely play into it and, and have fun with it. So uh, it's gotten a little bit um easier to get and easier to dish out throughout the army is one of the benefits um like from the old book that i can see um so that's that's definitely um a good change i think uh you used to have to wipe out the unit i believe net whereas now you just have to kill a model um so going to be easy to get those um uh, buffs and and also with um certain abilities like i said yeah dish them out to other units as well throughout the army and get everyone leveled up quicker. I would I would normally at this point ask you about like what a list might look like, but we do have a Castellay list as yep. well, so I'll hold that one. Um, yeah, I will sure. say battle battle crazed. I really like that at the end of the charge phase. You yeah, get plus one to your wound rolls for melee weapons. So being a Castellay monster could be a great for a solo terror geist. It could be a vampire lord on zombie dragon or Prince Vordry, Vangorian. Yeah. Yep, is is it... Vangorian lord of vampire? Yes. Yes. Yep. Vampire yeah, so monster. Van... Yep. So, yeah. Yep. Vango Van can do it. Um, yeah. Uh, like Prince V lo lost his uh, plus one to hit and wound roll spells but through this monstrous action and all that attack per se he's back there anyway so or titanic jewel but yeah or titanic yeah, jewel lot... depending if he's not versing a monster yeah so oh he'd miss out on this battle craze though if he was doing titanic jewel so true true yep. true yep it's... so uh yeah look i i like it I, look like i do like it i'm not saying it's not competitive i'm not saying yeah. that you can't have fun with it i just feel like if i was going to a tournament i'm probably more likely going to build a similar list in blood than castellai um but then again i don't value the eyes the eyes of the gods table as much as other people do in chaos so maybe it's just a preference to my style i i probably prefer uh not more guarantees versus, but yeah yeah, yeah bit more spike versus timmy which is ironic since i play sons i love to yeah smash. so true so, true. so it's a different it's... style of timmy this i think it's a different style of timmy timmy like yeah but i'm a destruction i count counting and tracking things are not my nature yeah just let's like to go in and maybe smash something maybe not <laughs> yeah so, what's your favorite command traits and artifacts so favorite command traits look the reroll charges is is good i'm not gonna lie but i like i said i do like the shifting key with the ability to dish out um certain is it the shift no the undead blade lord yeah sorry I always that, that was the one i was going to call out the un yeah. undead blade lord is one that i've yeah. seen a lot of people talk about being able to get yep. their general to pass on an ability yeah, to someone else yeah yeah, that one. So, yeah, once per turn, yeah. What is it? Um, after a unit gains a Might of the Crimson Keep, yeah, that general can um, get it as well. So you send your Blood uh, Knights in uh, as a bit of a first strike. They go in and they might um, yeah, take out certain unit. That just gives you generally uh, uh, ability as well. So start leveling up that um general before they you get them too like far into combat per se yeah 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 love it um yeah the shifting keep i'm not really you know that going from uh, a standard battle trait to something that you have to take and lose another buff for is a bit of a um bit of a miss uh and uh, yeah not not a great thing it was always another kind of 
if you're leaning in towards a heavy kind of vampire list moving away from some summonable units then it was always good to have your blood knights um the threat of your blood knights coming in off the board but um i think with the changes to um bringing back units um i feel like you'd it'd be a miss to just not at least have a couple of summonable units in in this army and try and bring some things back and use them as screens and chaff and stuff so objective capping and stuff like that so and they don't they don't even have a, a re-roll to the charge either like i was just having a as quick well. look at their war scroll so they didn't yep. even get plus so again it's a yeah at least they can soak like, with a three plus save and three wounds each they can probably handle um yep. failing the charge a little better than some of the other units yes yeah definitely yeah but like swift and deadly's probably if you like that efficiency, reroll charges around that around your generals really good. But I like the level up aspect of um, the undead blade lord ties into that um, whole theme quite well. Yeah, I probably would go undead blade lord uh, personally. Yeah. Um, yep. I mean, I do like reroll charges, but it does kind of bubble you up. Um, yeah. So and, and yeah, what about your artifacts? Um. What do we go? Yeah, Fragment of the Keep, for sure. Um, just that minus one to wound bubble is, yeah, going to make your um, your heavy hitters a lot more survivable. It's, it's you know, not not many people can, um, not many uh, armies can increase your wound rolls and, you know, subtracting them and debuffing wound rolls is, is quite strong. So... Add run, add add three to run and charge rolls. I guess is also a strong one. Uh, but grave sands shard probably, probably a a miss. Leave that one at home. And and it's a miss because you're likely not building many summonable units into your yeah, uh, your list. Exactly. So, um, you you definitely want a couple, but with the amount you can bring them back anyway um yeah it's probably not not something worth considering good call good call um something we haven't spoken about just yet is uh the true blades i think given that they are vampires it might be mm -hmm. a nice time to ask do you have any thoughts on the uh is it ascora whatever they call the true blades do you Ask do you like Ask them Bergen. yeah yeah, I was just quickly yeah, trying to look no, for the wall scroll to see their actual name. <laughs> I do like them. Um, yet to get the full reinforced unit, um, which I have in my list, uh, we'll see later on. I'm yet to get them fully um, painted up and into battle, but I feel like they're definitely going to have some play. And if you start getting some buffs on them, um, they're going to be, yeah, something to be feared per se. Yeah, like for you know, like I was looking at one of the questions that got submitted. You know, like there's, I feel like if you're going to run the True Blades or the Crimson Court, um, if you don't want to go all Blood Knights in Castellai, um, you can, you absolutely can. You can run a very heavy Blood Knights. Maybe you want to run some Fell Bats to, to support and maybe soak up and unleash Hell. But if you're yep. looking for a little bit of diversity. You know, you could run the True Blade, you could run the Crimson Court, you could run the Bloodborne, keep yep. with the vampire theme, but add different yeah. elements to your list. The Vehicles Bloodborne wouldn't get any of the buffs, unfortunately. They would, they're, they're still a fast. Are they, kind of, are they Vehicles, are they? Yeah, they're still Vehicles, oh. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It'd be nice to have some um, some neutral bloodborne through all the dynasties, you know. <laughs> I miss. I, I, I probably, blood... probably missed that one. I was thinking they were just vampires, but I probably missed that they were Veercross. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, they are. So, um, would be nice to put some buffs on them as well. But um, yeah, there are. Yeah, like you said, the Askurgan True Blades, the um, fights last on that they can give out if they're reinforced on a two plus is it could be really good so what about what about vargeist i i know they're probably like they're traditionally known more for the legion of night like manfred's type things yeah but they are vampires and yep. death's descent is a sweet new rule being able to set them up in reserve yeah. they've got the hunger 
they have exploding sixes, although they have only three attacks. Um, um, Vargas again are, is another slight disappointment. I wish oh, they got they did. You know, it's hard to complain when they did gain the hunger and the vamp. I uh, don't. They might have had the vampire keyword before, but they they definitely gained the hunger when they didn't mm. have it before. Um, but still, yeah, a little bit of a miss. I feel like with no rerolls, uh, no um, you know, rerolls or bonuses to charge. Again, being that deep strike um unit still just makes them a little bit and and them being a little bit more of a glass hammer even um you know you you switch these monsters are circling the battlefield waiting for their key moment to come in and they swoop in nine away and fail their charge like it just if they got some kind of bonus then maybe yeah some more reliability there but um yeah uh, yeah, I've, I've been disappointed too many times with Vargeist uh, yeah. because they fail the charge with a five-up save. Yeah, they've got four wounds, but yeah. they just die so quickly. They do, yeah. The, the hunger has made them a little bit more survivable, but and you can reinforce them to give them that, um, yeah, a bit more reliability, I guess, uh, or, or a bit more, you know, wounds, wounds dense density to make him maybe a little bit survivable, but then you if you don't have them in gal galatian veterans you know i think they're um still going to be having coherency issues and maybe not getting them all in and and they're, that, they're only know, they're only range one they're only yeah, range one still so yeah could have had some more improvements i think and maybe would have been worth considering a bit more like a lot of people love them they are still a good fast unit you don't have to keep them in deep strike or you can bring them in a bit more safer and then and and think a few turns ahead and bring him bring him into the fight later on but yeah they're, they're for what you're paying for them as well it's it's yeah it's still probably not not the optimal choice i think what are they like 200 180 uh i think they were like one 160 or something uh, yeah okay 155 155 okay that's not too yeah. bad was... yeah okay yeah. uh anything else with castellai like i think i think we've we've given them uh, yeah. a pretty good run i think i'm hearing that they are good uh yeah. there's definitely strong lists that you can build around um but they're probably a bit more i mean it depends on like again how much you want to lean into the the leveling up throughout the game versus the guaranteed stuff at the start which is what i enjoy yeah 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 D different play styles i guess um for certain people this this army will be um better suited so and you know next ghg might be more cav focused or monster or here you know like certain things could change and and it become more viable so Sure, like yeah, it, it could. If we go into a cavalry meta, then giddy up, blood knights, mm. absolutely blood, uh, amazing, amazing. Yep. Um, quickly, what about your Avangori? Uh, where do you stand with your Avangori? Again, another fun, definitely. Um, has had a bit of a glow up, I think, since uh, last time, but still just, just you know, lacking a little bit. Um, the monsters are still, for where they're pointed, are, are probably not, uh, you know, not going to, you're not going to get your money's worth fully with them, I think. Um, they pair well with the um, um, the Vengo Lord, uh, I think. And if you're going to, it could be a really fun kind of monster mash list. But again, you, you're missing out. Like, if you lean too far into it, you might... Um, miss out on your summonable units kind of yeah. benefits as well. So there could be a good balance list there where you do have a bit of lean into the Avangori stuff with a cup, a monster or, and a Vengo and a, and Lork of Eyes probably an auto take in it. But um, yeah, there's definitely some, um, some um, play as well, I think. Yeah, you could take it solo terror geist. You could take the Vengo Lord. You could. There's yep. a, a lot of different ways. I feel like if we ever went back into a monster meta, like imagine this type mm. of build at the start of third edition where there was like monster battle tactics. Yep. Um, this this really shines, but at the moment, yeah. 
I think for me, I want to build more around summonable troops in some capacity, skeletons, zombies, black knights, doggos. Yeah. yeah. The, you know, I think it's Lorca Vise. She has the spell that gives the um, six inch pile in, I think, that for, for Avangori monsters on a particular unit. That could be really strong with this unit, but then it's somewhat um, kind of is counterintuitive um, for your monstrous actions and stuff. You're not going to exactly pile in out of combat from six because you're going to be missing out on some of these um, monstrous actions, which the army techs into quite a lot. Um, but it could be good for you know hitting that unit uh behind the um chaff line or the you know the the screens and then going into your charging into your screens and then six inch piling uh, over your screens or once one of the monsters has killed the screens and you pile in all the rest of your monsters over the over the top so it could it could be good have, have its moments and i'm i'm keen to try it out yeah. Favorite command traits and artifacts? Uh, the artifacts are all that once per game kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I think it was, was it the crown? Well, the one that gives you fights first, I think it was. Uh, the, yeah, the, the, the gold collar. glass cl collar. Yeah, the collar was probably my favorite just for that once per battle key moment where you're like, I need to strike first or something like that. You know, or I need to get two activations in and, and get the most out of my monsters before they take a hit back or whatever but um as for the command trait uh, uh the definitely the monstrous might with the um the big bubble of minus one to wound rolls that um affect um your monsters that's super strong yeah okay i i don't mind unhinged rabbit uh rampager too but it, yep. it is relying on some sh enemy shooting so yes situational like it, it yeah it's going to be good but the i feel like the minus one to wounds is just is just money it's consistent it's going to be yeah. around a bit more um yeah. really quickly uh when i say quickly i mean like I, <laughs> we're almost at the two hour mark i know right <laughs> and this is the problem with the book folks like as yeah. much as i want to sit here and go through like bob what do you think of the coven throne bob <laughs> what do you think of the zombie dragon and the I like, ramble too well, we, no, no, no. It's not about rambling. It's just yeah. that the, val the value of each unit. Yeah. With with death, especially Sword Black Grave Lords, the power is not in one model. It's yeah. in the combination and the synergies across Definitely. multiple power pairs or trios. So yeah. we talk about the Coven Throne. We're going to talk about the other things that you need to really make the most of it. Then we go on a tangent, and like you just mm. you, you're here forever with this book. And oh yeah. As a, as a list builder, this goes back to what you said right at the start. It's exciting. Yeah. As a reviewer, we're here for 10 hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. I, uh, there is one guy out there that's done like a multi-part, like hours on hours in kind of uh, review of the book because it's just that you could just go for hours and hours. Yeah, yeah, you're here forever, which is exciting. And 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 obviously content creator is going to keep us employed for a long time. Yeah. Talking to Alex, like Lust for Domination was just his absolute favorite. Um, where do you stand on the Grand Strats? Um, it's it's just going to depend on what you what list you're building. There's probably a couple there that you wouldn't take. Um, maybe Crimson Larder, and uh, I think the Dance Macabre, where you probably just better off just choosing um, takes oh, what theirs. I mean, it's more restricted takes what theirs. So um empire of corpses is just so good so, like pretty much easy if you are taking lots and lots of not entirely msu but if you have a few msu units of and you have lots of summonable units that you're just throwing away i think i was talking to one of my other soul White players it's like maybe that minimum maybe five four or five summonable units in your army that you feel yeah. like you can get that as an auto maybe but it's it's again if if you're um say you're just winning um 
and you're not exactly losing any units and you're not going to get it so because nothing's dying to to be brought back so lust for do mm. domination is going to be pretty easy to get as well depending on on your um your game yeah yeah well, I think with... empire corpses goes really well with the summonables as you said but if i'm yeah. running 120 zombies maybe it's not the best strategy for me but if i'm going to have exactly a couple of units of, of skellies and like they're just tens or five doggos then yeah like this is easy money yeah 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 exactly take what theirs is always a good option if you're thinking about your gravesite placement and bringing something in at the end of the game that's died off and and snagging that uh grand strat towards the end of the game without going into the details of all your battle tactics do you think that they are achievable like do you have a bunch of achievable ones um are there ones that maybe you think you'd score more than others like where what's your high level overview of the battle tactics and where's the gold yeah they're they're all pretty good they're all situationally good like they're not you know um zinch or daughters of cain like autos uh they're all going to have their situations but uh um i feel like given that there's quite a few of them and uh that in combination with the other um battle tactics that you have through the ghb and stuff yet you, you're going to be hard pressed not to do five um in a game just because they're you're going to have these situations arise where you go oh there it is so yeah like the cursed on life is basically a guarantee you're gonna yeah. you, as long as you got a couple of on, vampires and, yes now with the uh especially now with the hunger change that's probably uh your 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 order your guarantee yeah like there's a couple and as you said like it's all situational but like when i look at this you know the choice choicest vintage uh callous overlord grasping yep. dead like expand the grave empires like they're all they're all relatively achievable it's just going to yep. be when you pull out the right card at the right time exactly yep yep keep them all in mind because they're all very achievable given a certain situation what's your first battle tactic you use as a, a turn one up because you don't have a lot of mobility to go and score um obviously the the the, the grave sites to help you do desecrate if you want to but is there ones that you find turn one you'll use uh, more than others? Um, uh, I think with the summonable heroes now, it's um, probably a little bit easier. You will you have you know you desecrate. You now have you, in the current GHB you have your um, um, what's it the cunning Tunnel maneuver? Mask. Yeah cunning maneuver you can bring your summonable hero down now and and not use your tunnel master you can save that for later in the game there's um you know like expand the grave empires you, you know there might be two outside of your objective outside of your territory which you can just go bang bang like yeah. two summonable units from the grave site so again it's just going to be mission dependent um you know it's a good shot yeah it's a good shout. Yeah. Uh, all right. Very quickly, Nagash. Do you like yeah. him? Don't you like him? And how many points would you pay for Nagash if you could decide? Because he's 965. Yeah. And talking to talking to people with OBR and Nagash, sorry, and, and, and Soul Blight, everyone has said so far that he's too expensive, and I would agree. Uh, I thought he probably, he'd probably be too expensive at 900, which is what his old points were. Yeah. So what's what's your thoughts on Nagy? Yeah, still too expensive. <laughs> like he's he's not 965. He's like 965 plus cogs because he still can miscast first go. And you know, I feel like if you're not taking cogs with him, then you yeah, you're just playing with fire with that many spells going off in a turn. So um he's yeah, he's just too expensive definitely got um some slight improvements there's definitely um it's again it's a bit of a sideways um change you know some nerf some improvements kind of thing um with his five up ward and stuff he's def you know if you are going to run him you'd run him with lots of bodies maybe a couple of small um foot heroes just to support those bodies and 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 um get the most out of them but 
yeah, with with uh, how much he's costs and he's still susceptible to that miscast. He's too expensive, I'd say. I think every every discussion I've had either online or offline is that his war scroll is better. Like yeah. if you look at the war scroll yeah. alone, he's got a glow up. And if yeah. you want to run Nagash because he's your favorite model, absolutely run him. Um, but it does restrict you to the amount of points you've got left, and it doesn't leave you a lot of wiggle room, especially if you add cogs as well. So yeah. um, I think like as a war scroll, it's fantastic. Yeah. The point just doesn't match what you get for your essentially thousand point investment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um I don't know what the right price is on him. I was what, what would you pay? What would this. you pay? What would you pay? Um probably around eight hundred. Around that um eight hundred mark. Maybe a bit more than techless, maybe um you know I'd say around eight hundred be good a good amount. You could still get that um more than half your points going into like the rest of your actual army. So if I was building a army around Nagash, let's say I was going to a, a tournament and I don't care. I just want to do the best I can with Nagash and I want to show it off. I think I'm building around skeletons because they're cheap. They yep. can be efficient. Uh, they yep. work well with the summonable and there's a lot of cool things that I can do. Um, I feel like zombies and skellies might just cost me too much um because you obviously your zombies are going to need you know uh, a necromancer is going to need a corpse cart uh so it doesn't it leaves you with even less um if you were going to run the gash in a soul blight what what would you build around yeah probably i mean i feel like there is play in both zombie zombies and skellies you don't necessarily have to use zombies in that big block to and and rely on that um uh corpse cart combination to um get some mortal wounds happening they could just be used as greens and chaff and to come back as those slight those msu msu units where they're dishing out mortal wounds when they die but then they come back as another unit of 10 and screen off and and just bodies and more bodies and bodies and maybe use your skellies as more of those reinforced blocks of you know that are just not dying and five up water around the gash like coming back mm. and you know that kind of four up rally mechanic at the um start of every combat phase like that's they're just not going to die around him so um bit of a combination of both could could work maybe leading more towards the msu with um zombies and some reinforced box with skellies. That's probably how I'd build. Yeah, I, I could see a mixture, whether it's uh, skelly zombies, skellies, doggos. I think, yeah, you're yeah. playing into the you're playing in the summonal space. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. G- given that we have a bit more of a focus with Blo- uh, Legion of Night and with um, Veercross, mm-hmm. would you take Ivia Volga, even though sh- uh, she is uh, a Veercross? Uh, I do love Behemoth Bane, and I think depending on where the meta sit, it's actually a really good rule. Yeah, if he is, um, she's a good war scroll. Uh, she's not an auto included by any means, um, but um, she's one of those named kind of um, characters that are are a bit more independent and like not entirely um, sub faction locked per se, because she's not really doing anything for anyone around her. She's kind of more there as an anti-monster piece which is which could be handy you know like send her up to you know that more crusher or whatever and just just neuter them so like she's definitely handy and you know could could build her into a lot of lists and and just run her a bit more independent so yeah she's good yeah I even like in a, if, yeah even in a castellai or a blood yep. list i would i would still consider her because oh, yeah. uh yeah Definitely. You, you don't need the veer cross abilities to make her work she yep. does what she does and she does it well exactly yeah she doesn't like it would be nice for her to gain some uh, other sub faction things but she doesn't need them that's not why you're bringing her so. she's self-contained like if you can exactly. ally into soul black grave lords she brings the hunger with her she brings behemoth blade with her she brings yep. the shrieking the shrieking swarm with her yeah i would ally i would ally her in i don't know i can't remember who can ally soul blight i assume night haunt can night haunt, I'd, bring, yeah. I'd bring her yeah. in 135 points is nothing definitely yep anti-monster piece it's great 
Yeah, so annoying. Counts as so 10 annoying. On, a, on the objective. So, yeah, it should be definitely worth looking at for other armies as well. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, all right, so now we're going to get to your list. So now we get to the good stuff here. Um, if you hung on this long, folks, you're yeah. rewarded with some cracking lists. So um, we have one Castellai list. We have one uh, Legion of Night list. Uh, what I want to hear from you in a minute when I read out the list is just tell me uh, what are the combinations and how does it work. So you've got, uh, is it Prince Duval? Duvali? Duval? Prince Duval. Duval. Du yeah. yeah. Prince Duval uh, with yep. the Soul, Spy uh, Soul Pike spell. Uh, yep. you got Vangorian Lord, which is the General, Undead Blade Lord with the Fragment of the Keep, uh, Spirit Gale uh, as the spell. You have Prince V with Vile Transference. You have two units of Blood Knights, a unit of Skellies. Uh, you obviously have the Crimson Keep to go with Prince, uh, P Crimson Court to go yep. with Prince Duval. Uh, you've got a unit of Black Knights and you have a unit of reinforced True Blades, which is um, quite tanky, uh, wrapped up in a double battle regiment for 100, 1985. Yep. So, uh, and take what's theirs is the uh, the Grand Strat. Yeah. So, Death Rattle Skellies, Black Knights, kind of just that filler at the end to uh, get some summonable units in, active screens, objective grabbing. That kind of thing. Um, the double reinforced Eskjurg and True Blades is, um, you know, they're able to get. They're they're not sub faction lock. They're able, they're vampire units, so they can get that um those buffs happening on them as well as they have their own slight buffs um, when they kill a monster. Um, so, you know, given you get these things off, or Prince Vordry can hand out certain buffs like you can get the askurg and true blades um uh up quite a bit like leveled up quite a bit um they are expensive but having them double reinforced gives you the two two curse bloods in their um in their unit which means that you can hand out the um fights last um on a two plus i believe it is so that um could be quite tasty you know getting multiple activations in on a unit when even when they charge you is um is quite strong quite powerful yeah it's a, so. it's, a, it's, it's a four plus and then you get to add one for each curse blood in the unit so yeah yep. it would be a, a two, plus. two plus yeah yep. so that then i think they're minus one to hit and wound against monsters so a little bit of an anti-monster piece that you could send in they could hold them up with that minus one to hit and wound as well as eventually take them down and get a good level up from that um blood knights i mean yeah the war scroll again was one of those slight sideways changes bit of an improvement in certain aspects um a bit more rend i think it was um bit and the extra range which helps a little bit but um you know the riders of ruin not being able to retreat and charge you know, it, it it's that was great. I'm not gonna lie. It, it was um, complained then, about. It was one of the things yeah. that when I when I put my preview out, one of the things yeah. that people most complained about was losing the yeah. retreat and charge. I, I can imagine. So but two units of five, like if they go into the same kind of screens, they could um possibly do be doing like two D three each. You could um blow up the screen before um through the charge and through the pile in that you pile in over the top of them into the um the juicier targets in behind with your two inch range or, or whatever you know it's going to be um not harder to screen out uh but like uh, your opponent will have to uh, think about screening them out a little bit differently so um it, it could work so their b battle line in um castle eye so um, you know, they, they're just a fast, you know, heavy hitting kind of unit. Hopefully you're sending, and if you're sending them into certain things, um, maybe think about, are they going to be able to kill them and, um, be free to charge next turn or, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, um, and again, if you're giving them level ups and bonuses, um, they, they also get stronger and stronger. So, um, 
Prince Duval and his Crimson Court, like all the um, uh, speaking of glow ups before, all the um, Underworld's War Bands got some glow ups. I think they all just got a bit better. Whether they're fully worth their points, yeah, I, th- I like they it, they could be like they're not sub faction locks, so they can gain the um, bonuses again. Uh, I believe now the Crimson Court, like they're 10 wounds plus Duval, I think it's 15 wounds all up for the 220 points. You know, they have some cool little abilities. They'd put out a little bit of damage, but um, I like really like um, Prince Duval gives out like a plus one to hit and wound spell. It's a short range, but um, definitely could be handy if you're getting him stuck into combat, um, say maybe next to the True Blades to give the true blades that bonus um he also has the ability i believe it's to um where if you tag the same unit as his buddies that he can make them only fight him i think it is or... oh yeah the side of the combat if you're uh if this unit if this unit and a friendly crimson court model are within three of the same unit you yep. can either your opponent gets to choose either to improve the ren characteristic of the possessed blade by one so that would make uh it ren two for two damage yep. or this unit cannot be a pa- attack cannot be cannot, can, yeah this unit cannot be picked as a to, to, to have attacks in melee so uh but that's your opponent's choice Yes, yes. So e- either right, they're probably going to pick the the Ren, probably. But you know, depending on what they think, like that that uh, um, if they pick the other one, it could shut down based on pylons and stuff like that. They could really shut down um, what they're doing. You know, there it's just another thing that they have to think about. So that in combination with their um with Askurg and True Blades fight last, you know, could all work out in their favor in our favor sorry yeah i've got two burning questions uh about the list so far why the vangorian lord instead of a vampire lord on zombie dragon because we've talked a lot about the vampire lord on zombie dragon um yeah is it a points thing or is there something more to the vango lord yeah yeah it's a points thing um i think like because the blood knights have gotten a bit more expensive like quite a decent amount of expensive and i wanted something on foot maybe that could get the bonuses being prince duval and his crimson court to work with alongside and um support the true blades then you know you it was more of a points thing and the vengo lord even though he works well and has these buffs buffs to monster units doesn't exactly need to run with them and him with the fragment of the keep the minus one to wound bubble same as his um minus one to ren bubble you know running in conjunction with prince vordry um you know handing out him and prince vordry handing out buffs as well as vengo lord um just gaining buffs could they could both become quite strong so a little power pair there so yeah and if people yeah. like this list but they're like oh, i still want my vampire lord cool just find yep. the extra points cut the skeletons exactly. drop the crimson court whatever you yep. want i think exactly. there's no way this is like the list it's just an example of how you might build a competitive list and run more yeah, blood exactly. knives run like some fell bats um the other question i had was is there a place in a castellai list where you might run a bloodseeker palaquin or a coven throne given that they are also vampires uh no not not anymore i feel they're those couple of units that i think and i'm probably not the only one thinking out there that they are just not um yeah not they've they've got that nerf you know they've been hit with a nerf so you're not sold no i'm not sold too expensive the war scrolls um the coven throne changed quite a lot it was you know it was definitely worth taking before and even though it got cheaper it it, um it lost its uh it had a really good spell yeah bringing in a possible vampire lord into your army is quite nice but in this castle list where you're not your vampire lord is not um giving out its um 
you know, it's not as much a support piece it is, as it is in another list. Um, you know, it's not really worth it. They're both, they're, they're, well, especially the, the Coven Throne is a lot more focused on the summonable, uh, yes. like the tactical insight, which probably doesn't yep. synergize well with Castellai. I mean, the Blood, and so the Bloodseeker one has a nice kind of ability where you get to plus one attacks characteristics of vampire units. So it would seem yeah, like. Yeah, because that's vampire. The other one's because yep. it's tied to summonable. Yeah, so this one it would seemingly suit in here, but you have to kill something with its attacks, and it's not got the greatest attacks, and as well as um, has to be an enemy unit too. It has to be an enemy hero. So the first enemy time an hero. enemy hero. Exactly. So if they don't have any good, like if they only have any cheap cheap heroes, and it is hard to kill sometimes if they're screened. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it's easier to achieve than it actually is, and. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Based I, on its I, I, attacks the, I, profile, um, based on its points, it's quite expensive, I believe. So it's probably not worth taking. Although you do have the Whale of the Damned, which starts at sixteen, that could do D three mortal wounds, and then in conjunction with that spell that does one or two mortal wounds each turn, yeah, uh, that, 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 there could be something in it. There, there could be something in it. True. Yeah, you could. Yeah, pop the uh, what is it? Twelve inches for the spell. So you could maybe get a small backline hero with the spell and then maybe um uh, blood siphon can do up to d6 mortal wounds too yeah. if you're within 12 yeah it has to be an attack so that's oh, the only yeah. thing ah so, yes it's true yes 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 true it's a slain by attack is not even attack anymore it's just an ability so that wouldn't even Ugh. work yeah Ugh. so uh, i can see i can see why yeah i can see why you've uh turned off it yeah so lovely to get that buff, but likelihood of it happening is probably not not gonna um, not gonna work out like you think initially, and and then you're just not getting its points worth, really, are you? So yeah, it's points points you could put into a more blood knights, but points yep. you could put into a vampire lord, like whatever. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you'd mention on the Castellai list, or let's do a sneak peek into the uh, the Legion of Night. Yeah, yep. Yeah, happy to go to the Legion Knight list, that's for sure. Actually, really quickly, why have you gone double Battle Reg? Like, why have you not gone for, I don't know, a Warlord or something else? Look, so f for this, the artifacts, I don't believe, were particularly, like, the only thing that I'd probably consider would be getting, which is, again, Mm, only really for this GHB would be maybe Askergan True Blades and uh, one of the other, maybe the Skellies, or uh, I guess it'd have to be the Skellies um, in Galatian Veterans just to get them hitting, um, get their attacks in a bit easier for the Askergan True Blades. Um, but yeah, just doubt, low drops could be um, quite impactful for a list like this where you um, want to just position aggressively and go in first turn or sit back and let the um, other player go move for, up to your ranges go, and stuff like that. Go go for the double between turn one and turn two, especially if there's shooting units where keep yourself safe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the other list is a Legion of Night. So you've got Manny, uh, Manfred with Waste Away, the Vampire yep. Lord with uh, the, the Morbeg's Claw, uh, Spirit Gale, and Fueled by Gurish Rage as the realm aspect of the champion. Uh, you've got the Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon, who's the general with the bait, Death Lance. Uh, how do you say this? The chop, chop. Uh, it took me like Cor 10 Corruptian. times to... Yeah, I think it took me like 10 times to actually <laughs> say this on the preview the video. The, yeah, yeah the, the, the cloak and you've got flaming weapon as the universal um, spell. Yeah. Got a necromancer, prison of grief, uh, skellies, uh, you've reinforced, zombies, you've got fell bats, you've got a mortis engine, you've got a corpse cart, and you've got some grave guards. So a lot yep. more summonable units wrapped up in a warlord, a uh, Galatian veteran, and a battle rage for 1975. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of wanted to just um, this, this, uh, having the bait with this uh, 
army like this uh, list means that you can afford to just either possibly be Alfred or be given first turn and throw things in their face from the grave sites and, and clog them up a little bit. So you, I thought I might go for the uh, many drops kind of aspect. Um, again, I spoke about it briefly when we were talking about the Net Legion of Knights, the Manfred and Vlozda kind of pair there with the two outer phase charges. Um, the Vampire Lord and Zombie Dragon uh, having that cloak to um, just heal, dish out wounds as it takes, as it, you know, as people inevitably miss their um, attacks on it. Um, the flaming weapon on this Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon, just because, yeah, it just it's just gonna, um, yeah, make it. It more, wants to um, slap. It wants, it to, wants slap. to slap. It, it's going to be played aggressively, you know, Man Manfred um, and um, them just charging in and fighting. So, uh, so the lance would be on the charge. The death lance would be Ren three, and with flaming weapon, was it damage four? four? Damage. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Damage four. So um, if you think it's going to be in multiple combats, maybe the more attacks on the claws would be better, but I think it works out yeah, much for much. I think um, sometimes people like to put um, the flaming weapon on like the, the most attacks possible so you get the most bank uh, um, for it. But um, yeah, making those three rend um lands damage attacks four. yeah damage four is is pretty pretty tasty so yeah what other combos so there's that combo that you'd be playing them aggressively using the monstrous action and on the vampire lord to you know try and neuter people's um uh uh charge phase uh and then you have just that 40 block of zombies with the corpse card and the necromancer just they're just kind of moving up the board big blob of you know dishing out mortal wounds as when they die as well as when they attack the mortis engines are kind of little um funny tech piece that um i was gonna ask you about it like yeah. that's the one that, that stands out like what's the what's that doing there Initially, I was a bit down on it because I've been using the Mortis Engine a lot for the plus one to cast and just slowly chipping away. And then that once per battle, you have that same pulse out on a more reliable roll. And two of those in a turn could could dish out, could pop and dish out a lot. But um, it's a bit harder to um, implement now. But when you do, it, it does a lot more. So... The six inch range of that um that uh i think what's it called the phylactery you, you build it up get some phylactery tokens and yeah you pop it and up. then you yeah it, so it, it, the, the range got smaller but it's more guaranteed yeah. but it's also a once per battle where it used to be i don't think it used to be once per battle the the phylactery used to be a once per battle, but it was the same whale of the damned on a two plus rather than a four plus. So it just uh, was a more reliable pulse. So it's definitely a lot more powerful, but no longer the plus one to cast and just having that um, build up of reliquity counters or whatever they're called. Yeah. Um, to, so you, it's just harder to implement. You got to position it, screen it well, make sure you get in to a position where so you. You have it behind the zombies. You've just le like building up those uh, tokens, and then you put it in a position where next turn you n might know you're getting the double, or you try and pile it in at the end of the um, the opponent's combat phase. So you're piling it into this big range of like that, well, this small range of of many as many targets as you can to pop that five or six mortal wounds on each of them. It's quite could be quite strong. But let's be honest, like when you've got a list looks like this, Manfred's gonna get the attention, the vampire lot on zombie dragons exactly. getting the attention. So your mortis engine is gonna be powering up. And you know what? If someone focuses on the mortis engine, cool. It means the others aren't getting targeted. Exactly. If they they ignore it, then you can just do this absolute blast. So yeah. it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. And so the 
um, Morbeg's Claw just kind of keys into that a little bit with making your cast a little bit more reliable, level up that um, um, counter a, a bit quicker. Um, yeah, so the that... also the Unholy Lodestone also gives another plus one to cast. So the range of the Whale of the Dam got a little bit uh, longer as well. Not that it's going to do too much again per se but over the course of the game it could um do quite a bit of chip mortal wounds as well as spirit gale as well as um the whale manfred's, yeah manfred's um winds of death as well which is another kind of um bubble d3 uh mortal wounds at uh spell so those in combination could do a lot of chip damage over the course of the game as well so something something that could pay off uh, after a few rounds of of them taking that especially spirit gale given that it's board wide it's not like an aura yep. so you can really chip away and do it from turn one and if we go into right now the galatian veteran focus where there's a lot more five or six wound idiots exactly then they die pretty quickly between yep. a couple of spirit gales plus a couple of these other options you've spoken yep. about and they become your ranged attacks that uh death is sorely lacking exactly yeah so yeah that uh, and it it's it's something that mo not everyone will sleep on but um like opponents won't you know not that you undersell it but you just say you know this can pop off and do some chip damage throughout this can do chip damage and then once you start adding up a few different types of chip tip damage it all pays off right so yeah, yeah it, it's it's what Seraphon used to do with Comet's Call and stuff. Like you just chip all, you know, Reign of Stars from the Star Drake. You're just chipping away and then come turn three when yeah. it's really important, those yeah. heroes are just ready to die. You've, you, the attrition really kicks in. Yeah, exactly. Um, I could I could talk to you forever, and yeah. I think we, we all know this, right? But I've got a couple of burning questions I want to ask from a bunch of listeners, and then we'll yeah. kind of wrap it up and bring it home yeah, because, good. again – so yeah. much in this bloody book. I know, right? <laughs> so much in this book. All yeah. right. So uh Nagash Apologist asking, do you think Legion of Night Black Knight builds are reasonable? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like um teching into that out of phase charge where you're charging in uh say if you've gone for the the white king on steed you've made him in general you've got a 15 block and all of a sudden they're uh charging in the opponent's charge phase as well as your charge phase that, that's yeah definitely going to add up and be quite nasty right 15 mortal wounds on the charge um basically if you you know within range of the um the white king it's a pretty pretty tasty combo so yeah, and uh, the Black Knights, correct me if I'm wrong, they have a minimum of a six-inch charge, right? So if you're smart with your yes. positioning, exactly. you can almost not fail that counter charge. So yep. Um, yep. I love it, love it. Yeah, uh, yeah and, definitely. And I, would, I, I would agree. I would agree with you. I think there's definitely a play, and I think there's going to be a lot more Black Knight builds uh, on the table. Oh, yeah. Uh, Rock, Rocket Ricardo saying uh, with Legion of Night – what is the go-to counter charge unit? So I guess we're already talking about this, right? So Blood Knights is definitely one. Um, I have a dream of casting Soul Pike on a unit and that charges in, takes the mortal, and then it's mopped up by a unit that counter charges with Black Knights. So we kind of already yeah. alluded to this a little bit. Yeah. Is this one of the dream combos? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's a good combo for sure. Yeah. Another, there's so many combos in Legion of Night that work well with that counter charge with, you know the spells other units like the vampire lord doing the um monstrous action all those kind of things that could work out to do quite a bit of damage and shut down um your opponent's charge phase where they where they should be doing the the work and not expecting legion knight like to be yeah yeah and it, it ties in nicely like if you read the the lore of legion of knight and manfred manfred never just runs up and just goes to attack Manfred is about sneak attacking and, you know, mm -hmm. attacking at a weak point. So uh, it ties in nicely. Uh, Rocket Ricardo also asking, are uh, doggos or dire wolves um, a thing in Legion of Night over zombies? I feel the six-inch pile-in synergizes well with countercharge, or is that too much? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the thing with this book. Like, you can, there are so many combos, like, so many combos, and it all depends on what you, um, you know, like, what you're using those um, different units for. Like, you could definitely um, make counter charge a unit in so when they're in the range of that six inch pile in from the dogs so that they um are in position to just pile in rather than you know you're locking them into the combat right there with the unit you charged into as well as the six inch pile in from the dogs that are coming in that's what i i would so with with rocket ricardo's question i would say the answer would be no i think the doggos are a great counter charge after unit. So let's say the Black Knights is example, right? Mm -hmm. You drag them in with is it ageless cunning? You bring yep. them in with the counter charge. Yep. Then at the end, if you can get someone within six inches, then you pile in the doggos without yep. ageless cunning because they've already got the six yes. inch pile in. Yeah, exactly. Where, yeah, you're not charging opposed... them in with. Yeah, you're not charging them in with the ageless cunning. No, you use no them. no. You're positioning them so that they can still come in, tie up units to then be charged again next turn or, or, or whatever, you know. So I don't think you'd be using them for the charge. You're using more of those units that do something on the charge as well, on top of yeah. just charging and shutting down the other opponent's charge. Which is where the Black Knights come in so well. Black they Knights, they come in so yeah. well, or Blood Knights even, for additional yep. mortals on the charge. The Vampire yep. Lord and Zombie Dragon for the Ren yep. 3. Uh, yep. Two more burning questions are from Dino Diner. Um, how much do we prefer Gravesight Deep Striking for objective control versus preparing for a turn one Alpha Strike? So I guess given the Legions of Night and uh, Castellai focus, mm -hmm. Um, how do you see your grave sites on objective control versus going in for the kill early? So Castle are definitely leaning more towards objective control because you're not really bringing in, uh, unless you do bring in some grave guard or whatever to ha have some summonable units that also act as a bit of a hammer. Um, but yeah, probably if you're leaning in more into that heavy vampire build with a few summonable units, you're using that for that objective control. Whereas... Um, Legion and I, you'd probably be just setting up to have both in mind, you know. Um, that's how I'd always generally do it, with both in mind, um, based on the opponent, based on how you feel, if think they'll um, deploy and, and that kind of thing. So um, I definitely wouldn't ever not consider having some kind of objective control with um, my graveyard, uh, graveyard, uh, graveyard. Um, placement but um definitely um the, the turn one alpha could be good with the bait for a bit of a alpha pin kind of situation where you send in some units of zombies or something with a um bodies or saves to just go in and pin the pin the um uh, opponent in the deployment zone yeah, I tend to agree. I think I've got preferences, but I never have one play. So I think it ultimately comes down to who's going first, or if I'm getting the choice of going first. Um, exactly. Doing, is it is there shooting? Where are the objectives? How many objectives? How fast is it going to be to control? Yep. What my battle tactics are going to be? So um, I also always used to love the threat of of um, of summonable units because, yeah. uh, and, and I would and I would always hold my summonable units towards the very end if I'm not doing battle reg, so that my opponent as they're deploying doesn't know if I'm going into the grave or not, and yeah, exactly. it gives me the choice to to drip feed over time, which is why I'm not a big fan of battle regiment. I love being able to dictate de deployment um, and playing around with some of those options. Yeah, yep. Um, yeah, definitely I've found I've tried low drops and tried high drops and um, have found more and more in time that the more drops in this army can be better. Um, I think I did mention to you that I think the more Tark of Blood ability could be very powerful in a one drop with the ability to reposition a Neferata and some things for a possible alpha if you're getting first turn. But, um, yeah, that's, uh, 
yeah another discussion so yeah that, that that's a different like outside of like nephi agreed that yeah. being able to like deploy and then re redeploy a couple of others is beautiful but yeah. outside yeah. of that yeah. yeah bob um yeah. I've already, I think we've already asked the final question, so I'm not going to go to that. We've already talked about reinforcing versus MSU. That was the yep. last question I wanted to ask, but maybe the, to kind of bring us home is, is there any final advice or anything you'd want to share about Sawblight that we haven't spoken about from your experience? Maybe if I'm picking this up for the first time, um, anything you'd want to share at this particular point? Um, mainly just like, yeah um get your reps in yeah have a play it's a very deep book like we've said multiple times just stay start playing lists get your reps in um try and i i also think like don't just change your list every time just um get multiple reps in with the same list might if there's try and work out the combos over time but yeah just get some games in and practice up practice practice i remember it was very frustrating for me learning this army because often i would lose when i lost it was because i made the wrong decision at the wrong time whether it was i put summonable units in the grave and i over anticipated them getting out or mm. i didn't think about someone getting close to my grave site and then blocking off where i could pop them out or over expecting what someone could do in damage or um at the time, obviously, Van Hales and how that kind of interacted with the double fighting. And yep. I found that, you know, when I got really successful with Legion of Night back in the old book, it was when I, I just did reps, 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 yep. and I had a much better anticipation. So I, I, I thousand percent agree. It's not, wasn't the list. It yep. was about all the little nuances, the techie pieces that I needed so to many. know when to use the right piece at the right time and that just took time deliberate practice yeah. it's a thinker's man's army there's lots to think about and um lots of bubbles lots of synergies lots of um key timing um things as well as um order of activation and and so yeah. so many things that yeah reps will help you out with that I didn't realize how many, how, how much synergy and techie that was going to be. So, uh, and I picked, I picked Legion of Night, so I made it probably harder for myself. But mm -hmm. is there any shout outs you want to make? Anyone you want to say hello to? Um, you, you're going to be, you're going to be at my tournament in a couple of months' time, Sydney GT. Yeah. Um, I'm so keen. It's, it's yeah. the second biggest, second biggest in Australia. Um, yeah. So, not too bad, not too bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely a shout out my, uh, my local club, the Moor Tribe, um, just Maitland area wargaming. We um, are a fairly new community, but um, yeah, growing and growing and growing, and it's good to see. So shout out to all those guys, Jacob, Nathan. You know, um, shout out to my wife and you know my family for letting me do this hobby and uh, go to these tournaments and stuff. So very very supportive there. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. Shout out oh, to the awesome. Australian community as well. Yeah, we're pretty good. We're pretty yeah. good. And uh, yeah, are you coming to Slaughter? Yeah, coming to Slaughter, Sydney GT. Might get on the waiting list for Bathurst GT. And hopefully we have a GT up our way towards the end of the year. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. That'd be awesome. I need some practice before LVO. Let's, yeah. let's, let's do it. Sounds good. Bob. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, YouTube -y stuff, guys. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please like the video. If you have some thoughts, and hopefully now you feel a much more confident between this discussion and Alex's discussion and all of the insights that I pulled out in the preview video that's now three on, on the Soul Black Grave Lords. Uh, we are recording, if you haven't noticed, before any FAQs or erratas. So points may change, rules may change. Bob, I don't think there's actually many things that could change, to be honest. It's not like there's anything broken here. Um, there might be some points adjustments, but I can't see that happening till the next General's Handbook. So mm -hmm. I feel like from an errata point of view, there's not really anything I'd be worried about. No, the the only thing is the miss on the um, corpse cart thing, but we all know, we all know how to play that. <laughs> So, the, the miss being that a corpse cart summonable and blah 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 bring back a corpse cart no you shouldn't be able to do that like
So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Bob, thanks for your time. Hope you enjoyed Thank it. You. Leave a comment. Let me know, folks. And, uh, yeah, you know, like and subscribe. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you press like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord, and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spellcast.